<clears throat> Good morning. My name is Don Michaelman, and I want to welcome you to the August 11th, 2022 public hearing of the Planning and Zoning Commission of the City of Prescott. Uh, I'd like to welcome Council Member Rusing attending here. Uh, we'll have the members of the commission introduce themselves and start with Butch. Good morning, Butch Tracy. Tom Riley. Was. Ted Gamboji. <laughs> Stan Goligoski. <laughs> Tom Hutchinson. And now we have our act together. We'll proceed with the meeting here on this. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. This is an open public hearing and is being taped, recorded, and videotaped by the city. The proceedings are being televised by representatives of the public media the public, local cable and or radio stations, and may also be rebroadcast. The number of commissioners present is six. It will require a majority vote of those present to pass a motion. As some individuals may be attending this meeting remotely, all parties wishing to be heard, including commission members, are required to state their name prior to speaking in order to ensure accurate minutes. Members of the public, when called upon, are required to state their name and address for the record so that we may know who is speaking and be able to contact them at a later date if necessary on that. Staff members will introduce themselves when they come up to make a presentation on it. So the first item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from July 14th, 2022. Are there any corrections? If no corrections, is there a motion? Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the minutes. We have a motion to approve. Is there a second? Uh, I'd second it, Butch Tracy. We have a motion to approve the minutes and second it. Any further discussion? If no further discussion, Kaylee, would you call the roll? Butch Tracy. Present. Or yes. Yes. <laughs> Say yes. So you motioned for it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tom Riley. Yes. Like Tom Hutchison. Uh, I was absent, so I'm going to recuse okay. myself. I will note that. Stan Goligoski. Yes. Ted Gamboji. Yes. Don Michaelman. Yes. The motion passes 5-0. Next item on the agenda is discussion and review of LDC 22-001 land development code amendment to section 2.1.4 and section 5.2 <coughs> to replace the airport noise overlay district ano with a new airport vicinity overlay will be known as avo uh, criteria and create district boundary george thank you mr chairman i'm george Worley. i'm the planning manager for the city uh, today's the purpose of today's meeting is to introduce the commission as a whole to the proposed language of the AVO. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for spelling it out. We'll just use the acronym from now on. Uh, the AVO is intended to be an overlay district, and overlay districts in the city of Prescott's land development code are the zoning districts that sit on top of multiple other zoning districts, and they're usually for specific reasons. Typically, they're protection of certain areas. We protect uh, corridors, for instance, we have a commercial corridor overlay that protects most of State Route 69 and most of uh, Willow Creek Road. That corridor is designed to put additional requirements or additional protections in place. And the same concept lies behind the AVO. We have a presentation today that is almost identical to the presentation that was made to the mayor's ad hoc committee that occurred a week ago. If you recall, about Six weeks ago, we had made a presentation. Um, the airport director and I presented to council the concept of moving this forward. As a result of that, a joint meeting was scheduled between this body and the plan and the uh, city council. Um, that happened about three weeks ago. 
And then last week, we had a meeting of a subcommittee that was created out of that meeting with council and this body um, to discuss more of the specifics of the document, which we hadn't talked about before. And now today will be the fourth meeting to talk about the, the ABO in concept, but the second meeting to talk in detail about the actual text of the proposed code changes. So we'll start out today, if you um, like, with a presentation, again, similar to the one that was done for the ad hoc committee, and then follow that up with calling up the text of the document and working our <laughs> way through it like we've done on other code amendments in the past. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Robin Sabata, our airport director. Yeah, I'll just introduce myself. This is myself. not Robin Sabata. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My name is Joseph Young. I'm the city attorney. I want to introduce myself to you. I haven't uh, been here and haven't met some of you. Uh, Matt Padraki is representing our office in this matters, but wanted to introduce myself and, and go over a couple of the ground rules. What you're deciding is what's best for this area, not necessarily how it relates to pre-existing rights. So once this is in place, there will be some pre-existing rights we'll have to determine that the AVO doesn't apply to. For, exi for example, existing structures will be grandfathered in, as we called it. And so you don't need to worry about pre-existing structures. There's also pre-existing agreements that may have rights um, that'll be superior to this overlay district as well. And we'll have to make that determination. Um, but I just want to make sure that you all are making the right determination uh, based on what you believe for the airport overlay district, as opposed to the pre-existing rights, which is a separate determination uh, that will be made. So. We're here for any questions, and I'll leave it to Dr. Sabata to give the presentation. Thank you, sir. Good morning, members of the Planning and Zoning Board. Um, I'm Robin Sabata. I'm the airport director, and I've been the airport director since January of 2018. So we've seen a lot of changes happen at the airport, and this is actually in concert with not only what's happened in those last four years, um, but also what has been in place for the last, say, 20 years um, in terms of protections for the airport and for the area around the airport, because we believe this is equally supportive of protecting the community while protecting the airport. It looks like it's not moving forward. There we go. So just to refresh, the airport area is actually comprised of a tapestry of plans that have been placed in some cases for many years, in some cases for decades. First, in 2009, the airport master plan, which was ultimately adopted by the city council, um, had an appendix that was re uh, specifically referred to as the land use plan. Um, in this, there, it's acknowledged that there is a layered approach. Um, it looked at the general plan that was in place at the time, the airport specific area plan, and a variety of noise and interior sound level and safety and compatibility um, uses that were identified in the land use plan. It created noise contours, which were published at that time, and airport impact zones. It, com it also created a compatible land use matrix comprised of six zones, and it stated that residential would be okay if it was outside the 55 DNL noise contour. It created land use densities and an open space matrix, and it also created land use compatibility matrix associated with some ranching parcels near the airport. The second major plan that we reference and that we are actually looking at in terms of the code changes that you're making today was foundational as the airport specific area plan. It was originally adopted in 2001. It has had several revisions. It was the first entity that established what we refer to as the airport influence area. And in that area, navigation easements have been required since 2001 of all the new developments. It referenced airport impact zones and noise contour and also tied those to land use limits, very similar to what you're doing today. And in residential, it, it allowed residential only in impact zone six and outside at that point the 60 DNL contour. There was an exception added in 2017 as part of the development agreement and master plan associated with uh, Deepwell Ranch. And that exception um, created, um, a, it created an exception that included uh, the possibility of a holistic land use plan to protect the long-term operations of the airport. We do believe that we need to fix that because it's frankly um, a little bit of a broad um, exception and it's very hard to enforce. 
the general plan in 2015 actually had section five, goal five, state that apply these compatible land uses when the, within the airport impact zones and airport area, which permit continued responsible development and protection of the airport viability. Specifically, 5.1 in the general plan, which was approved by the voters in 2015, stated that we need to protect the airport from encroachment of incompatible land uses through amendments to the LDC and the ASAP, that's the Land Use Development Code and the Airport Specific Area Plan to reflect FAA guidance and enforcement of land use designations and policies and zoning designation. This is referring to the land use plan in which that was uh, adopted back in 2011. Additionally, it, uh, the general plan called to establish an airport area commercial employment zoning district, which is, does not permit residential uses. The point of this is there has been ample previous planning precedent and in the case of the general plan, a recommendation that this guidance be codified. The airport master plan appendix three, the land use plan actually did for the first time introduce the concept of airport impact zones. Those airport impact zones were created based on NTSB or National Transportation Safety Board historic data. That particular data looks at the possibility of impacts or crashes that could happen in airports. And what it does is it sets up levels of risk associated. And you can see on the bottom right hand corner of this chart, each of the impact zones is associated with a risk level. Per this particular land use plan, using those impact zones for guidance, residential was deemed acceptable in zones four, five, and six, as long as they're outside the 55 DNL contour and at low to mid density. The idea is high density can contribute to having no place for an aircraft to go if in those few moments where it may lose an engine, it has to point and land. We wanted to avoid sensitive structures. Sensitive uses such as churches, daycares, and schools are okay in zone six outside the 60 DNL under the land use plan. The airport. Robin, a quick question. Sure. Um, the impact zone methodology is something that's common to every airport? It's common to many airports. What happens is as you get bigger with larger aircraft, Sometimes the noise contours end up eclipsing those impact zones, and so you don't have to do the impact zones and the noise contours if you have if the contours completely eclipse those impact zones, providing that layer of protection. In the case of our airport, it is 311,000 operations last year, but because it's smaller aircraft, those noise contours have not eclipsed like they would have at a larger airport with larger aircraft. So this is using FAA guidance, and it, the same guidance was used to actually create these originally in 20, um, 2009. And actually, these impact zones have been revalidated as late as uh, four years ago in the California guidance for land use. They went back and revalidated these same impact zones, just Thank to give you. you an example. So the airport specific area plan, again, was established in 2001. This is the latest land use plan associated with the airport specific area plan. As you can see at the top, the zones are specifically referenced these impact zones are, as well as specific reference to using a, a, um, a contour to further define acceptable land uses. This is where the impact zones show up on that map and were adopted into the um, airport specific area plan. And specifically what it does say is residential and commercial uses as permitted by zoning code, no residential within the 60 DNL or higher, and I'd like to point out that you'll notice it says L sub DN up there. That is the way we used to say DNL. DNL is a measurement that stands for day and night average sound level, and it can be written either way as L sub DN, or it can be DNL. So I'm referring to the same, and it's a measurement of noise energy, an average measurement. In that same airport specific area plan, that land use plan I just showed you that referenced the contour, the 60 DNL contour was also included in that plan. And you can see that is a reference of putting in basically a, a requirement through the airport specific area plan that that area be protected. So these are the contours, the noise contours that were generated. Um, these are most recently generated a few months ago. Um, it's important to note that these were generated using the aviation environmental design tool that is approved by the FAA. 
Ours was actually enhanced a bit further than the standard model or tool in that we were able to incorporate actual Prescott area noise tracking from 2011. So this takes it up to the highest level of, of uh, accuracy um, in the nation. Um, HMMH, which is Harris, Miller, Miller & Hansen, did create these noise contours with the approval of the FAA in the methodology and its use, and the actual data for this was provided to us by the FAA. So, as I'd like to point out that currently in the code, it does point to the 65 DNL contour as being the area of current protection. And so also you can see that impact zones are shown in this diagram. So you can see how that overlays. And there is a third significant protected area that we're looking at. The area here in to the left and down and around is called the airline one engine inoperative departure splay. When an air carrier departs this airport, it is required to calculate what would happen if it lost an engine. And to be able to accurately depart the airport with that one engine situation and not encounter any obstacles that would take the aircraft down. So this is the protection area here for that one engine inoperative departure splay. The concern is that if an obstruction were to occur somewhere in here that would affect the ability of the aircraft to effectively take off, the carrier would have to further limit weight on board the aircraft. And so what is at um, risk here is the possibility of future air service to our airport because right now the afternoon flight departs with sometimes between 20 and 25 aircraft seats blocked because we are a hot and high airport and so in order to take off it cannot sell those seats and there is not viability into the future nor the ability for us to get off essential air service subsidies if we do not assure that these are obstruction free areas because if the only measure for the carrier to take off is to further reduce seats it will become economically unviable for carriers to serve this airport. Mm -hmm. And I believe we all want air service and we would like to see more air service and more <coughs> flight options. So it's really important we protect this one engine departure splay. On noise contours, just so you know, the FAA official position on land use and noise contours is that the responsibility for determining permissible land use between, between specific properties and noise contour contours rests with the local authorities. We, however, have an obligation under our airport grant assurances, the most current grant assurance we just signed last week, and which these assurances or strings that are attached to grants state that we must reasonably assure compatible land use and continued current and future normal aircraft operations can occur at this airport. This obligation is in place for 20 years. So a, we do have to be mindful of the fact that we have this obligation, but the FAA doesn't come in and tell you the land use control. It is the local government that needs to maintain the land use to allow that compatibility and assure that compatibility will happen. The FAA works on the pathway of using incentives. They can help with interior sound level mitigation in the future if we need that. Robin. Yes. Question, please. Yes. Uh, is if an airport has to or an airline has to reduce 25 seats is that considered ner normal airport operations no thank you May I ask a question All right. Tom Riley um, when you say that the in the display area the protections that are required in the display area could you give us a flesh that out just a little bit what kind of protections are you talking about so the F the FAA requires that the carry Carriers operating under Federal Aviation Regulation 121 and 135, those are scheduled and unscheduled operators, must assure that they have a safe pathway to depart an airport with one engine and not incur an obstacle that could cause a problem with the airplane. So this is the official recorded airline splay area and we're having this validated by an airspace expert. By next Wednesday, this will be finally validated, but this is anticipated to be this play. You have to make sure that, that if, if the land use is not compatible such that additional objects or obstructions could penetrate, 
then they would have to go back and adjust the weight that's available on board the plane to the point that they probably would no longer be viable. Tell me more about what those, uh, give me some examples of what those obstacles are. Anything that is above the current level of obstacles that current exist, currently exist. <laughs> so they have that... to be evaluated for its potential impact. Okay, so basically I'm trying to get my head around the uses that would be allowed in it's that supply about, area. In that area, it would be height limited. So, for example, on average, although it's being validated and we'll have actually um, a, a map that will show approximately the height, there's a concern at this end, to be clear. Terrain is already raising, rising to the west. Mm -hmm. This is already, in essence, it, it makes it more difficult to put obstacles on top because the terrain is rising and the air carrier requires a certain clearance. Usually it's about... For every 62 to 63 feet, you can put another one foot up in terms of an obstacle height. But as at this end of the airport, what's happening is the terrain is also increasing. So it makes it more challenging because an obstacle can, can be in an area a little bit further out and still be an obstacle to this splay. So what kind of a height limit are you looking at in this splay area? What we're going to do is we're going to have it diagrammed all the way out in the splay as to how high an obstacle can be based on the ground elevation. So it depends on the ground elevation to answer your question. We would have to take together the, the ground elevation with the departure path of the aircraft and then calculate what the safe level is above that. So we don't have that information as of now. As of right now, we have a prior splay that was based on an advisory circular model, but this is specific to the aircraft operating at the airport and anticipated to operate in the next 20 years. And we don't have any information, though, about what the height restrictions that will be required. Well, we do know the width of the splay. What we're asking them to calculate for the benefit of those who own the land is specifically every so many feet, what that would mean in terms of a height of an object as an additional courtesy we would provide to those developers. Okay, but that information does not exist as of now? In terms of what I could tell you, what you could build at this particular place right there, right now? Mm -hmm. No, that would go through an airspace analysis, but that's very similar to the FAA's airspace analysis that I'm going to be discussing in a moment. They will not come out in advance and tell you everything you can do everywhere. You, you subject it to an analysis, and I'll show you that in a minute if that's okay. 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 So we're, we were talking about noise contours, and um, so... FAR Part 150, Federal Aviation Regulation Part 50, is what establishes how you create those contours and the methodology that is used for those contours. It is recommended that you do one contour generation now and one at least five years from now in order for people to see how that impact can, how that impact can you know, play out over several years. We are going out for a demand capacity, a forecasting analysis, um, and it's going to be back in about six to eight weeks. We are going to run future contours so that everybody will also be able to see those future contours. But right now we have um, solid contours for, for current, and we do want to also give people the information they need for the future. The 65 DNL is currently used in our code, and it does match the FAA's what's referred to as a level of significance. Um, the FAA determined back in 1980 that the level of significance is 65 DNL. That's average sound energy, average doubt. So when people say to me, well, how noisy is that? It's an average level, so you could have impacts or single event noise that could be 100 decibels or 90 decibels, the equivalent of a rock concert. And you could have noise events that could be 60 or 50 or 40. And what happens is it's an average of those. And so we're actually seeing in these contours an average sound level, a daily dose and an annual dose at a location. So a single event noise should not be confused with this, this uh, contour that's being generated. Robin, question. Go ahead. <clears throat> when people complain about airport noise. Are they complaining about DNL or the single event noise? They're generally con uh, concerned with a single event. Okay. However, the FAA does not use the single event <coughs> approach. It uses an average noise level or doses <coughs> at, at, as its indicator. And is the DNL an average of the single events? Yes. Okay. 
It also has certain penalties in the case of the um, FAA approved noise model for everybody in the United States except California. It also adds an, an extra decibel level for events that occur after 10 o'clock at night and before 7 in the morning. In California, they also do an extra dose for 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. at night, but we don't use that here. So the two options that they had back in the 1980s when the FAA were selecting which um, DNL level that they wanted to adopt, they looked at two. The EPA um, said that it would be 55 DNL to provide a reasonable margin of safety. HUD at the time said a 65 DNL provided a reasonable margin of safety, and it was based on something referred to as the Schultz curve, in which it was believed that only 10% within the 65 DNL would be highly annoyed. In 2021, the FAA published the latest research referred to as the National Environmental Survey. And what we found is in the National Environmental Survey of 10,000 homes near 20 airports, 60 to 70 percent of persons who were in the 65 DNL were highly annoyed. Within the 60 DNL, 50 percent are highly annoyed. And with even the 55 DNL, 33 percent are highly annoyed, which suggests the possibility that they may not be pleased with the overflight and certainly may move to action against any future development of the airport, which is a concern. Clearly, in the case of Santa Monica, Despite the fact that they had protections in place at the 65 DNL, the airport is facing closure right now because of the fact that that was not an adequate measure of whether or not the community could tolerate the noise levels to which it's being exposed. There are more stringent local and state noise level standards throughout the country, and the FAA does not oppose those. And in fact, there have been court cases that support those lower noise uh, levels. California, Oregon, and Colorado are all examples of areas that have adopted more stringent noise contours in order to better protect the airport and the community. Down below, as I had stated in the ad hoc meeting, there are, this is an example of the Denver Regional Council of Government that says basically noise sensitive uses such as single family residential, schools, hospitals, and churches would only be marginally acceptable in the 55 to 60, normally unacceptable in the 60, and clearly unacceptable within the 65. Robin, can you give us a little history of what is the Denver Regional Council of Government? It's all the air, it's all the communities or jurisdictions that are in some proximity to Denver Regional Airport. Okay. Excuse me, Rob. Yes. <clears throat> Butch Tracy. The, like, just to 55 DNL, are they based on decibels, obviously? Mm -hmm. Do you know what that level is? I mean, does the 55 <laughs> have anything to do with the decibel level? Or, or what, yes. what are they basing that on? So the, fi the, the, the contours themselves are generated from a culmination of all events exposed to over a 24-hour period. And then it's also called annual, so it's over a year's period, the dose that you would have. We refer to it as the daily dose that you get of sound energy. So again, a single event noise, um, like a garbage disposal at three feet being an 80 or 90 decibel event, mm -hmm. clearly people are not being exposed to that every minute of every day. So what they do is they take those single events and they average them out over a 24-hour period and ultimately present it as the, um, the contour level. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. So the, that's basically like a <coughs> base level for mm -hmm. sound in that period? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so with this base information, and remember, you've always you've already met with the city council, and we've already had an entire session that was much more detailed than this. I did want to point out to you the benefits of the proposed AVO. And George, did you want to step up on this? Or do you want me? To? Okay. So the proposed AVO does provide map boundaries for all the noise and impact zones. It allow it includes allowable uses or limits within those zones and contours. It does provide clear explanation of each of those various zones and contours so we know the purpose and, and where, the, you know, where they're at. It also provides explanation and boundary for the avigation easement. I do want to again point out, though, that the avigation easement requirement has been in place since 2001. This is nothing new. Um, the document has been modified somewhat over the years, but not ex extensively. And so that is a requirement that is not changing, but it is incorporated into this um, ABO. 
This ABO will provide a fair notice disclosure requirement to residents and to renters. It provides boundaries and notice for the FAA baseline evaluation, which will speak to the question about the FAA baseline, and I have that on the next slide. It also provides additional protections for critical airspace that includes the airline's one engine inoperative departure. It also provides measures for hazard prevention, mitigation, and removal. This often applies to trees um, where they grow to a height that they become an issue. And then it also promotes community health, safety, and welfare, which is a primary goal of what we're trying to achieve, is a, an AVO that protects both the airport and the community. It assures that we comply with our federal grant assurance, reg assurances regarding to uh, obstructions and compatible land use, and obviously supports future airport development. I do want to point out that to date since I arrived, we received more than $50 million in um, grant funding or grant commitments in just four years. And we are looking at another $100 million in future grants in the next five to six years, including the runway extension, and another $30 million in the investment of the air traffic control tower. Our simulation for our new tower is scheduled for later this month. And then finally, it also acknowledges that the airport as an economic generator is such an important part of our community. Its economic impact is $194 million, and it's attributable to uh, 1,220 jobs. So if you want to look at this visually, this shows you the airport, airspace, and community layers of protection. We've discussed the airport impact zones, which are included in the AVO. We've discussed the noise contours. We've discussed the airline one engine departure. And I mentioned the FAA basic or base evaluation for airspace. And this actually speaks to um, the earlier question about do we know where an obstruction can and cannot be? Um, when the FAA does its evaluation of any new object or proposed construction, you go through what's called a 7460 process. That's a notice of proposed construction or alteration. That actually applies to within 20,000 feet of the end of any runway that you will have to submit just a request for it to be evaluated. Often it's immediately, if it's further out, immediately released is not an issue. But that evaluation process is about 45 to 60 days. And during that time, they look at several things, and I'd like to point out to you on this map. For example, this is part of the FAA's base evaluation, is all of this approach and departure surface at each end. They also look at the issue of um, this big, what looks like an inner tube. <laughs> this right here is the, um, one of the zones, what, what we refer to as imaginary surfaces, and it evaluates those. What you don't even see on here are all the instrument approaches and departures associated with the runways, and those can also be impacted by an obstruction. So again, when a proposed construction or alteration occurs here, we will also evaluate it here. So both of these are evaluated as a proposal and what it would impact. We will be showing these on the map where these areas are so that people will see they're in an area that needs to have an evaluation of this or this. But in every case, we cannot predict in every spot. The FAA cannot predict, nor can we predict, where a particular obstruction is and how tall it can be at that one point. It is an evaluation process. In addition, the easements and disclosures um, include the airport influence area, uh, boundary, which requires navigation easements. The public disclosure map, which is required by the state of Arizona, so that's this box right here, is, is, uh, is a disclosure. And then there'll be the fair notice disclosure. And I'd like to refresh, this area in turquoise right here is the airport influence area that has been in effect since 2001. <coughs> so altogether, this is your layers Excuse of me, protection. Robin? Yep. Would you re repeat that, that since 2001? Yes. This is called the airport influence area in turquoise. It has been in code and in effect since 2001. Thank you. So we are not changing the boundary of that in this code. It is the same boundary. May I ask a question regarding this map? What is the long rectangle yellow box area to the essentially the north of the airport this? with the green line through it. Oh, 
Northwest. No. The yard, large yellow box, I'm sorry. Up to, at the top, right, yeah. You just oh, this one? Over. Yeah. Okay, so this is the airline display going out to the west, <laughs> which we're asking the airspace um, analyst to validate. This is the display going to the east. The interesting part is you see where they intersect right there? That intersection point is actually the Drake VOR located out near Chino Valley. It looks like a big bowling pin. Have you seen it out there? It's a navigational device. A VOR stands for Very High Frequency Omnidirectional Range Indication Station. When a pilot leaves and is in trouble, either way, their goal is to get to this location to be able to try to work out the issue and then get themselves in a position to get back and safely land on the airport without an issue occurring. So the point is on these OEI displays is to take you out to a safe area away from the population. Okay, so we're not seeing the whole, I'm sorry, Tom Riley, we're not seeing the whole splay that from the takeoff, if you take off towards the east, it would actually curve around. It curves right around like this here, I'll show you. It just went off the page, right there. Okay, got it, thank you. No problem. What is not on here is the fact that at the end of each runway, for 20,000 feet, the FAA um, required basic evaluation is triggered. So if you want to do a 200-foot crane somewhere 18,000 feet, it's possible that you will have to get clearance. Generally, it'll be approved with like a red light on top or something, so there are mitigation strategies for that. But it's a, it's a process that can take 45 to 60 days for, for the evaluation. And there would be also evaluation time for the one engine departure in answer to your earlier question. Thank you. Robin, can you give us an estimate with your pointer up there how far 20,000 feet would be? Uh, actually, we have a map. Would you like to launch the map? Don't you have it? Um, I thought we had it right here. Yeah, I can show you it. Um, it's from the council chambers. 7460? There you go. And again, that's nothing new. That is in, within Federal Aviation Regulation Part 77, which refers to airspace and obstructions. And so it is, it's established by federal regulation. The green lines, the circle up there, mm -hmm. is it? And the reason that they're little bulbous is it's 20,000 feet from the end of each runway. You see that? So you take it 20, so it has a little bit of a, the circles have an overlap. So what happens is, let's just say you have a crane that you're gonna put up like over here or over here. And it's obviously outside what you just saw is the airport influence area. If you have to put a crane up over here, you would go into the, um, the FAA's tool it's an online tool and you put in the elevation of the ground level, the proposed height of the obstruction and the latitude and longitude of the object. You say if it's a temporary or permanent or the type of object and then they may take up to 45 days or sometimes you get an immediate feedback that says this one is not, this is so far out it's not an issue for us. So conceivably every building that is built within that has to go through this process? You just, yes, you just, put it in their tool and it immediately tells you, is there gonna be a time before you find out or immediately, particularly in the case of probably if it's, unless it's a really, really tall, like a 150 or 200 foot of, you know, crane, generally within the airport influence area is where you might be required to do what we call mitigation. Um, mitigation might include a red obstruction light. Uh, if it's directly at the end of a runway, it might say, though, that this is going to affect an approach, and we will reserve the right to not accept that structure if it would affect um, normal operations of the airport. Okay. Now, I can tell you that some of the um, proposals around the airport have had cranes that were taller than what would have been permanently approved, but the FAA does allow you to work with, for example, builders, if they're going to bring in a large crane, we just have to time it, because if they do it at the time the carrier is on takeoff and it interferes with the airline splay, then they might not be able to take off because if there's a crane at the end, a red light cannot be used to mitigate what would be an aircraft in trouble with one engine out. So with regard to the obstruction evaluation that the FAA does, the temporary cranes can go up. But with regard to the airline splay, it would be really important that we make sure and coordinate those temporary obstructions so they're not occurring at the time of an aircraft flight. But we can work around it too, okay? 
And I think, do we want to do density? You want to grab density? Okay. Remember, it was my last slide that was density that you had updated. Before Robin sits down, are there any additional questions for Robin? Okay. Thank you, Robin. So that was all the fun stuff. Now we're gonna talk about text and specific requirements. Uh, one of the things that we've talked about um, a little bit in this is compatibility and land use density is part of that compa compatibility determination. Land use density is how many units per acre um, we have in homes. And there are several different ways to do that. One is to cluster homes and leave lots of open space, and another is just general density. The general density issue is more of the problem that we're trying to address. And what we've done as part of the AVO, and I'll show it to you in the actual document as we go through that, is to address the various impact zones and how much density we anticipate in, again, residential density measured in the number of homes or residential units, so apartment units, duplex units or individual single family homes are allowed within each of those zones. As you can see, the first three zones are proposed to allow zero. And that per our table, and we'll look at the table shortly when we start going through the document, those impact zones are such a high risk area that residential is unsafe in them by most measures. So we're showing zero, uh, no residential allowed within zones one, two, and three. Zones four, five, and six, Potent <coughs> certainly. May I ask a question? You say the, uh, I'm looking at this table, it says maximum recommended land use density, persons per acre. In zone one is zero, zone two is 20, zone three is 60. So these are for non-residential zones. So we're talking about a commercial space in this case. So you don't have a residential use, you have commercial uses with occupants, and the occupants are what we're talking about in that column. So the column just to the right of that is residential uses, and where we measure by the number of dwelling units instead of persons. Okay, so this is maximum, this is commercial, residential. So the first is non-residential, second is residential, and then the third is a recommendation on open space. Okay, that's not clear on here, thank you. So again, with dwelling units for zones four, five, and six, we're looking at roughly seven dwelling units per acre as a maximum, and that's uh, consistent with the low to medium density that uh, Robin mentioned during the presentation as being incorporated into the airport specific area plan, recommendations, and the general plan. So the definition of what that is is uh, uh, based on the general plan language, the currently adopted general plan language. The caveat with those are that all of these are presuming that those residential uses are going to occur outside the, the 55 DNL line. Again, the line that is currently proposed as the boundary for residential is a noise contour. There are additional requirements based on impact zones that can affect residential and other uses depending on whether or not they're within that 55 DNL. Do you have any questions about these specifically? Not yet. Not yet? Could I make one clarification? Mm -hmm. And on this slide, you'll notice the last paragraph. It basically said the level of risk is correlated with population density, where higher densities pose a higher statistical risk to the safety of persons in the event of an accident. Therefore, land use with high population densities are discouraged in the vicinity of the airport. And that's why open space is so important at the end of the, um, the runways. Um, what we learned from the crash that happened in May is the gentleman, when he took off, lost his engine, and he had between 10 and 12 seconds in order to point at what would be an open space area. So having those areas when an aircraft has lost its ability to control the plane, largely, is really important. All right, so I'm going to show you first a map, if it will cooperate with me. There we go. 
We've talked a lot about various zones, impact zones, and noise contours, and we do have a map. We've given you a hard copy of this. This will also be an addendum to, or an appendix to, uh, the ABO as it moves forward uh, for further review and, and ultimately council action. Um, this is intended to show various areas in town. Uh, we do have some boundaries that we're showing of, of developments that we know are anticipated. And we're showing you impact zones as lines underneath, and then the various DNL contours as the colored zones. So you can see the areas are covered. Most of the impact zones are within um, one or more of the DNL, the 55 contour being the largest, uh, but not all of them. So again, one of the reasons we're showing both and including both in this document, um, if you recall, Robin mentioned that some airports, the, the noise zones are so large that the impact zones really become superfluous as far as regulation go. You use the noise contour. We do have noise contours that exceed the boundaries of, or impact zones that exceed the boundaries of the noise contours. So we're indicating both and including both in the document. So the recommendation is to have controls on impact zones and controls on noise contours both. So they will simultaneously apply and work with each other in the text. And we'll get to that in the text itself. We'll talk about it. Do you have any questions about the map at this point? We can always come back to any of these. Uh, George, uh, Ted Gamboji. Um, at our joint session, one of the things I had asked for was an overlay of everything put together. So I wanted to thank you for this. So the, the only thing this doesn't include is the outside boundary, the airport influence area boundary <coughs> that we chose as the outside boundary of the AVO. Again, one of the things we don't want to do is to invent things if we've already got criteria in place. And we have a criteria already in place requiring um, the navigation easements within that boundary, it's already mapped boundary, already existing, so our recommendation is to use that already existing boundary for all of the ABO purposes. All of the impact zones and all of the noise contours fall within that boundary um, where the city of Prescott boundary is concerned. Okay, that was all the fun stuff. I'm gonna pull up the actual text, and we'll walk our way through this. If you uh, participated in or watched, maybe I'll do that. Participated or watched the ad hoc committee meeting, what we did was go through this document page by page, looking at each paragraph. Um, this is, this is gonna be a, a quick review of some of the changes that have already occurred at staff level. So I wanna to talk to you about the things that we're recommending. Mostly came from our, our legal department review, um, but then we'll go into uh, an actual page by page look at this. First thing we're doing is creating the AVO by definition. So this section of the code creates all of our overlay districts and defines what they are. So we're changing airport noise overlay in this proposal to airport vicinity overlay because it's more than just noise that's being controlled. The next step is to go into the purpose. Um, I think we've explained the purpose of this really well. Uh, we're protecting both the airport from development encro encroachment and residents from impacts from aircraft overflights. This is mutually beneficial to both in our opinion because the more development you have near the airport, the more likely you're gonna have impacts on the airport's operations. Um, Robin's explanation of that was pretty clear. Houses can cause height obstructions. You can have annoyed uh, residents who may complain. And vice versa, if we have aircraft overflights, the enjoyment of someone's home could be impaired. So we're protecting um, each of the, the airport and the residents for the area. We've looked at the applicability section to talk about why and where. And that's again the section where we looked at where the exterior boundaries of should be. We have the airport influence area already mapped and there are already impacts. The requirement for navigation easement has been on the books. Property owners all already have an impact within that area. They have to provide us with a navigation easement. What this does is add some of the additional requirements into that same boundary. So the boundary of the ABO and the boundary of the airport influence area are coincident with each other. We've defined it with a map. 
the map is actually the same map we just showed you for the AIA. It will have labels on it that specifically say that it's both the AIA and the AVO. Sorry about all the acronyms. One of the things that we, we wanted to do right up front, though, is to explain clearly what within each of those areas we're dealing with. So we've spelled out airport impact zones, we've spelled out what the no noise contours are, and we've just consistently used that language throughout. Stop me at any point you have questions, please. So one of the th first things we wanna do right after <coughs> explaining where this is, is to explain what the impact zones are because they're an important part of this. Impact zones are quite literally places that aircraft could crash or could land in emergency situations. Um, they also are areas that have a higher impact from aircraft overflight, whether it's noise or materials that may, may drop from aircraft or emissions from aircraft engines. Those impact zones have uh, def definitions. Those definitions are based on FAA uh, documentation, and that was adopted into the airport's um, land use plan way back in 2009. Robin hit that as part of her, her history of this process. So what we've done is simply copy all of that specific language over into this document uh, to include it all in one document. Uh, one of the things I think you, you noticed early on, because we have a tapestry of coverage of the airport, one of the benefits of doing something new now is to incorporate all of that tapestry into a single document and control most of the things that are controlled by these various documents in one place to make it easy for everyone to find, everyone to understand, whether it's us, city staff, you as a planning commission, or the de development community, or the residents of an area you want to know what's going on in a particular area. It'll all be in the AVO, with the exception of a few minor things that are controlled directly by the FAA, such as the 7460 requirement. So we've defined each of those impact zones. We've shown you the list of them. They are consistent with, in fact, they're identical to the list in the airport um, uh, master plan. For clarification, because it's important for anyone wanting to know how we created those zones, we've added the actual table that comes from FAA uh, documentation on how to calculate those zones. And this table shows you dimensions and calculations on those zones depending on uh, runway length uh, primarily, but it's laid out exactly how these zones were calculated. So not only have we done it, but we've given you the recipe. George, do we have anything that can identify <coughs> which of the three runways listed here are at the, where they're at at the airport? Is we, like the we, 1230 the cross runway? Yes. Yes, 12, runway 1230 is the crosswind runway. Runway three right, two one left is the major commercial service runway. Runway three left, two one right is the parallel general aviation runway. Okay, thank you. And I'd, I'd like to add that the reason we thought this was important is in the original document, um, the, I do want to point out that um, part of the impact zones were discrepantly shown in a diagram. This is the actual information and validating data. So we wanted to make sure, because we did extend one of those zones visually on the map to match this table, um, because we discovered mm -hmm. that, that discrepancy last year. Um, when And I can refer back to a map, but the point is we wanted to make sure that the table that was originally in the land use plan, which was accurate, um, is also incorporated along with the diagram. Because visually it doesn't always tell you how far or how long something is. I have a quick question, um, just for, um, for clarification. <clears throat> On zone one, you have three dimensions there. I assume that that's height, length, and width. The trapezoidal shape is slightly differently. It isn't a rectangle, it's a trapezoid. So it's the initial, the end, and so the So it's, it's two-dimensional, not three. That's correct. Thank you. Some of the zones are rectangles and some have different shapes. Okay, no, that, that explains that. that thank you. So at this point, what we'd like to do is to start walking through the table. I know all of you have this information, and what we're hoping for are questions about each of these sections or about individual lines within these sections. Let us explain to you why we're recommending it this way. And if you have suggestions, um, that is the purpose of this meeting is to get your input. Um, 
Right off the bat, we start out with um, some of the lower intensity uses, agricultural type uses, ranching type uses. They are generally <coughs> more compatible with the airport and can be in the higher intensity zones. This is an inverse list. Zone one is the highest intensity where the most impacts occur, and zone six is the lowest. So the lower the number, the more intensity, the more we want to protect particular uses within or prohibit particular uses within those zones. Uh, commercial designation is a little bit different. Um, I actually expect some questions from you about this one in that most commercial uses are going to be compatible to a degree. Some commercial uses, though, have more of a, a long-term impact that are closer to residential uses or they're very noise sensitive. And where they're very noise sensitive, we're concerned about how close they can be to the airport as well. So there'll be some controls relating to um, the noise contour line they're in, but the impact zones count too in those areas. So one of the, th one of the things I think we, um, I'm actually thinking of getting rid of something here. Excuse me, just a moment. Okay. Uh, one of the things that we're concerned about, I'm going to zoom it in a little bit more too, are the various uses in commercial are the types of uses that often have a fairly large um, occupant level. So you'll see as we work our way through this that some of the uses that you may picture as being fully commercial because they have a high occupant level potentially have more adverse impact depending on which zone they're in. Uh, some things obvious. If it's aircraft related, aircraft fuel, aircraft repairs, but being close to the airport's probably okay for those guys. So we're not looking at um, those as if they're something that's similar to a use that doesn't need to be near the airport. Vehicles, building materials, things like that tend to have a fairly low density of occupants. They're Lowe's, large warehouse buildings, they're um, auto dealerships, things that have um, large area but fewer occupants, they tend to be much more compatible with the airport. Again, from a safety standpoint, you're less likely to put more people in danger by being closer to the airport. Uh, one of the things that we had questions about were uh, gasoline service stations. <coughs> um, I think Commissioner Gamboji asked specifically about that one. And the biggest concern with, with stations, typically a, a commercial gasoline station is going to have the, the gasoline storage tanks underground and with protections to prevent um, an explosion or a fire based on the, the tanks themselves. So we, we specifically put in the above ground tank limitation. So a, a use that might not be a, a commercial operation but stores fuel on site would not be able to store fuel in an above ground tank because of the danger of the above ground tank. So we've identified that very specifically and required that um, no above ground tanks. Um, restaurants, food, beverage, that's a toss up. Uh, Sir, sorry. The gasoline service stations, what about uh, places out there, like there's, a, there's a rock, op earth operation out there now, and they have gasoline, then it's usually above the surface. Is that considered a no-no anymore? or It would be considered a no-no in the future. Okay. So again, they're already existing operation. Mm -hmm. the, this will affect operations uh, or projects in the future once it's adopted. Um, it seems a bad idea to have above ground fuel, fuel tanks within certain impact zones. That particular use um, is not in many of the impact zones. Uh, if you recall, oh, just it, it could be. It could <laughs> be in future, and we would restrict above ground tanks in those cases if okay. this is adopted. So if it's there now, it's good to go. As with You're most, not going to make them change it? As with most zoning, um, from the adoption date, from the effective date of the ordinance forward is how zoning works. So most zoning does not go backwards. In fact, it's very difficult to make zoning retroactive. Um, this would apply in future for anything that would come into us for a permit, for some kind of mining operation or an industrial site or um, maybe a, an excavation location. Okay, thank you. You'll notice some of the items have um, an asterisk associated with them uh, in the list. These are depicted in a footnote or described in a footnote. These are the ones that have <laughs> an additional requirement for consideration of the noise contour. So not only are they controlled, restricted, controlled is the proper word, um, 
by the impact zones themselves, but they're also limited because they're noise sensitive uses. Uh, picture yourself going to a convention center and having the aircraft fly over you once every minute and a half. Um, at 200 feet or 500 feet above. Those are types of uses that shouldn't be close to the airport because of the noise impacts that would occur associated with it. So not only is it controlled by which impact zone it can be in, but it's also controlled uh, by the DNL line. And at this point, we are specifically calling out the 55 DNL for residential uses and for noise sensitive <clears throat> uses and it's important to keep in mind that we're talking about noise which is defined as not good sound as opposed to sounds that we may like so these are negative impacts that we're protecting these uses from uh, same situation with the next one down, fuel dealers. Um, this is the above ground tank situation, the same concept. These may be wholesale rather than retail, rather than commercial gas stations. Other uses may be much more compatible. Uh, mini storage uses generally don't have many people in them. We discourage you living in your mini storage and we discourage you being in there very often just by the use of it. Uh, the population density, the number of people who may be on a site are really relatively low. As long as it's not on Willow Creek Road, right? No comment. <clears throat> Warehouse distribution, the same thing. It's the similar concept of very low density of occupancy. Again, some of the uh, concern is with chemical storage. Above ground tanks, again, are a problem. Uh, store, storing chemicals for industrial or commercial uses is pretty common. That needs to be done in a safe manner if you're within one of the impact zones. The next section, did you have any, anyone else have any questions about that section before we move on? One quick one, George. <clears throat> if uh, a tank has been grandfathered in, now if the tank has to be repaired, it can be repaired and stay there. <clears throat> if the tank is pulled out for a period of time, then it can't go back. Generally, the way non-conforming uses work is that if they are damaged or destroyed by an, an act outside of the control of the property owner, lightning hits them, uh, something happens, the building catches fire. Um, those types of uses generally are allowed to replace themselves. And we have specific language in our land development code that applies throughout all of the zoning code to how to, to address those. We don't want to penalize you because your house got hit by lightning and burned down. What we want to do, though, is to stop someone from replacing it with something that could have even more impact. So you're correct. If someone were to come in and say, I have an above ground fuel storage tank, I'm going to pull it out, we're going to say you can't put it back above ground. Either keep it, maintain it, or put it below ground for safety reasons if it falls within one of these particular impact zones. And, and that's a, a common theme throughout all of our land development code. George, I have a question for you. Sure. Um, <clears throat> referring to the three footnotes, the, the asterisk that says noise sensitive uses and residential uses are only permitted within uh, air impact <clears throat> zone six outside of the 55 DNL contour line, and then in brackets, future DNL. Explain why that future DNL is <coughs> in there. That, that is something I'm, I'm going to ask Robin to explain that. One of the things that we look at with airport areas is not just the noise impacts now. We know volume is increasing at the airport, so we have to look at future uh, potential impacts. Anyway. So when the ad, ad hoc committee met last week, and I think it was really helpful, um, Ted, one of the things you mentioned was uh, particularly helpful. It says, how much impact is there for the decisions that we're about to make? 55 was the area that we felt comfortable that could be potentially p protected, but as a backup, the future 60 was discussed as a, maybe a slightly less onerous line in terms of its um, its its level of expanse, but before we could make that decision, you asked us to get information, and we did, and actually, the information was very helpful, and we are recommending now the 55 based on that information, so we'll be getting to that in just a moment, and that's why it showed up yes, as reflecting what the ad hoc committee said was it's either going to be the 55 or a future 60 is what they were kind of leaning toward, but with this extra information, you'll see. I, re I recall that now. Yeah, yeah thanks. It's a good question, though, for the other commissioners who may not have attended that meeting or watched that meeting. So thank you. Uh, 
we've talked about the commercial, general commercial area. We have commercial employment, which is a larger area that covers um, places that maybe have a, a higher density of population within the buildings. Um, these are employment locations, uh, office buildings, public buildings. Um, those types of uses and places often will have a higher vo volume of, of people and therefore need different protections than those that may have a lower volume of people inside. One of the things that we're recommending a change to, um, Rob and I had a conversation about this yesterday, uh, personal services and healthcare, health clinics, uh, both of those have a, a relatively steady volume of people, but they're passing through on a regular basis. So it's not like a situation where you may have a use such as a church where people will come and they're there for a, an extended period of time. These uses have a constant flow of people, and perhaps that uh, requirement or limitation on the 55 DNL line may not be necessary for them. Um, we're actually recommending that we remove that limitation and allow those uses within the 55, but still subject to uh, impact zone six only and not any of the higher risk zones. So that's one thing to consider. We're recommending remove that asterisk, allow those uses within the 55. And if you have any comments or questions about that, feel free. As we, I sorry. do have a question. Just want to make sure. I'm you get special <coughs> treatment because of the shirt. <laughs> um, the impact zones that we're discussing in this table are just the impact zones, and then as an overlay on top of this, is the noise contours. The noise contours. That's correct. Okay, Both so layers protect the uses, but for different reasons. Noise because of noise impacts and the impact zones because of safety impacts. So this is the safety impacts and then we're gonna look at another, would any of these uses be allowed within the 55? In this particular case, we're re recommending to allow the personal services health clinic type uses within the 55. So we're suggesting remove the asterisk that we put in originally and allow those uses within that noise contour, but still subject to the limitations of the, the various um, impact zones. Uh, so again, the impact zones are where we don't want planes to hit a building. The noise contours are uh, adversely affecting people within the building or within their use. So if you're going to the hairdresser, if you're going to um, a, a clinic for a visit to the doctor, your time there is relatively short. It's different than if you're going to a hospital where you're maybe that. staying overnight or a church where you're going to be there for several hours. So the uses that are highlighted here that have an asterisk on them are not allowed inside the 55? Correct. We're recommending against allowing those within the 55 because they are longer-term uses and uses that are sensitive to noise. And large assembly. And large assembly, but again, that, that's part of the sensitive to noise situation. So some things, such as a, an RV park, <laughs> we're not proposing to allow within the 55. RVs are not well insulated. A plane flying over a house will have a certain level of impact on the resident of the house and a much larger impact on someone who's in an RV. RV parks tend to be longer term. Someone will be there for a week or two weeks. It's not just a stop like you would have at a medical clinic or if you were to go to a doctor's office for a visit that should take an hour but really takes two. Um, one of the things that we were looking at, again, is the longer-term use is because, again, the impact on a person staying there is going to be higher the longer that person is there. So things like residential uses where you live are obviously a high priority for protection within that 55 or protection from being within the 55. But some of the commercial uses that we've listed in the table have very similar circumstances. <clears throat> For the purpose of both noise impacts and safety zones, hospitals, correction facilities, and schools um, are, are, are all um, highly impacted by noise. They're highly impacted by the potential for a plane crash, and the populations within them are somewhat constrained. Um, but I, I have a 
an intern here who will tell you that being in school and being in a correction facility probably are similar. You're tied in there all day. I mean, you're basically locked in. And because it's a long period of time, the noise sensitivity comes back in. And again, why we're suggesting that those, those should not be allowed within the, the noise contours and should only be allowed in the impact zone six to avoid the direct safety risk as well as the adverse impact of noise. Uh, the next, the next uh, road down, we're talking about um, various types of, and I see I didn't strike through something, various types of uh, gathering areas. Um, large gathering areas like libraries and daycare centers and social clubs, again, have long use periods hours at a time that people would be in these various locations and therefore noise sensitivity is high. Um, as we go through, that changes a little bit. Um, we don't have a lot of concerns for, uh, for instance, uh, uh, cemeteries, and I'm not even going to go into an explanation of that one. Um, utilities, power stations, things like that. Again, low, low density of, of employees and short time frames that people are on site, not nearly as um, subject to noise impacts. And I, we're about at the bottom, except for the most important, uh, unless you have questions about industrial, those are pretty obvious. Residential, regardless of the type of residential, are sensitive to noise. People will be in those facilities, within those buildings for long periods of time, subject to the aircraft overflight noise for long periods of time. And our recommendation <coughs> with this um, proposed document is to uh, restrict those uses to areas outside of the 55 line. So again, we're trying to protect future residents from having to experience a lot of long-term noise and overflight um, within their, their place of residence. With that, I would be open to any questions you have about anything in the table so far before we step into the next piece of this document. Questions? Could we take a break? <laughs> <laughs> That's more of a statement than a question. Okay. Uh, what are we at, about 10 after? 10-10. Ten, ten. <coughs> And 10. 10. Back in 10 minutes. Thank you. In session now on that. George, you want to continue? Thank you, sir. One of the things I didn't mention before, um, we've made some edits <coughs> to this document. As you can see, some things were uh, proposed edits by staff. One of the things this doesn't reflect is the large venues and libraries, daycares, et cetera, are, are not examples of the large venue. They're all separate things. So we're going to remove this uh, EG designation here. We're talking about large gathering venues. We're talking about libraries. We're talking about daycare. We're not separating them out as to only large libraries and large daycares. So just for clarification there, um, I missed striking through that one when I should have. So we're basically down to discussion of the residential impacts. Um, we've treated all of the residential pretty much the same. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're a, a group home uh, or a single family home or a caretaker who lives on, on site on a particular use, although we were applying something somewhat different. I shouldn't have called caretakers out there. Um, they're all long-term occupancy uses and therefore subject to sound sensitivity and therefore they're pretty much all controlled the same way, not within the 55 DNL. The um, caretaker units we have shown slightly differently in um, the table because those are actually places where people live but they're being paid to live there. So when we say caretaker, we're talking about a night watchman situation, not a home health care person. We're talking about someone who is on a commercial or industrial property for the purpose of watching that property or controlling. Um, up until very recently, for instance, a mini storage very often had someone there who operated the office. If you wanted to rent a mini storage unit, you drove down, you talked to the person who lives there, they're being paid to live there on the site to rent your, your unit. Um, technology has pretty much eliminated that uh, for any new units, but that's what we mean by caretaker. It's it's someone who is on a commercial property for commercial purpose to watch the property or to manage or maintain the property. George, I'd like to go back to the governmental institutional one. Mm -hmm. And we have yes, athletic sir. fields. 
Are we viewing athletic fields more like an intramural where the two teams are out to play and so forth versus a athletic field that could have a large crowd there? For the most part, yes. So these are athletic fields that would be associated with other uses. They're also something that we anticipate would have relatively time delimited uses. You're, you're not there for, um, you know, f four hours or eight hours or like a residential a use for the long term. Right. So, so yes, it, it's not considered for, I, I mean, if we get a national sports team want to move here, I'm sure we can make an exception for them. But the, the intent of this is to just control those impacts. <laughs> Do we have any more questions about this before we move on? Yeah, yes, sir. I, have, I do have one, George, if I Certainly. can. Certainly. Can you explain to me what the difference is between this table and the outlined uses versus existing zoning? This is an adjunct to Table 2.3 in our land development code. Table 2.3 is a basic control of what uses can go within which zoning district. This is an additional control on top of that. Remember, it's an overlay district that sits on top of the existing zoning districts. So if you are an allowed use by your zoning district, we will then consult this table to see if you're also an allowed use by this table. You have to meet both triggers to be allowed. Uh, if one table says yes and the other table says no, the answer is no. That's something that's common throughout overlay districts. So the base, base uses are controlled by table 2.3, our land use table that covers all of the city of Prescott. And then this area within the airport influence area, the boundary, would be separately and additionally controlled by the overlay restrictions. So you could have permission to have residential based on base zoning. Our commercial districts allow residential uses by right. But you may be in an impact zone or within a noise contour where residential <coughs> is inappropriate based on the criteria that we've used to develop this overlay. So we would say no to residential in that circumstance. Again, these are two layers and that means two reviews. A review on the base layer, a review on the overlay. And we do that now with commercial corridor districts. We do exactly the same review uh, for them. We do the same review for the manufactured home overlay district that we have. Again, we look, are you allowed residential? If the answer is yes, are you allowed manufactured homes? If the answer is yes, you can have a manufactured home. If the answer is no in either of those two tables, the answer is no. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Did you have a question, sir? No. Okay. That was a questioning stance you had. <laughs> Before we move forward, hmm? would you like to bring up that map? Before we move forward, um, I'd like to also supplement the answer to that question with the map that we had shown early on. This one? Yes. I think it's behind there. <clears throat> So we showed you this map earlier just to show the overlay of the different uses and the different controls we have in place. In this case, you have the noise contours. You can see those. Within those, and, and they're a lighter gray line, are the impact zones. We don't have them identified by number, but we do have maps that clearly identify them, and they will be shown on the zoning map as part of the adoption of this document. The, the zoning map will be amended to show both the contours <coughs> and the impact zones as a requirement because this is zoning we're doing. So we're showing all of the impact zones and all of the overlap of noise contours with those impact zones on this map. And again, we've identified what the various um, noise contours are. We don't have the impact zones identified by number, but we do have that mapped, and, and we have shown you that before. Uh, Robin had that in the presentation that she showed you earlier. Zones one through six are shown on, on those various maps. Again, that will be on the zoning map because that is a requirement of a zoning code. George, uh, while you have that map up, would you point out for everyone here where there is current residential housing with sure. your cursor? So there are several areas that are uh, affected by this that have residential housing already existing. 
I'm going to start over here and work my way east. So this area is within Deep Rail Ranch. This is um, Saddlewood, I believe they're advertising it as. It was originally um, Antelope Crossings and Westwood. These subdivisions exist. They're mostly built out. And if this goes into effect, um, as it's drawn on the map now, they would become legal non-conforming uses. They can continue to um, exist in those locations. They can build back if there's a disaster. They're permitted to stay there. As you get closer into the airport, there's some residential uses here. There are residential uses here. This is the golf course community that the city of Prescott developed back in the 70s. <coughs> there are potential residential uses for a couple of areas, and I've actually asked the mapping folks to call them out here. There's a mining operation here. Its zoning currently is single-family residential, but it's in the bottom of Granite Creek. So practically, no residential is going to go there because of FEMA requirements. So there's a limitation on that one. There's some potential residential over here and potential residential down here. They don't exist yet. The only other area where residential already exists and is somewhat impacted is the outer edge of some of the property along here. Those are already mostly existing um, industrial zoning districts, and the existing residences there are already nonconforming uses because our industrial district doesn't allow them. That zoning occurred after the residences were placed there. So relatively small areas already existing um, <coughs> residential density, and that's the biggest one. And then there's some as you go further south. This is Pinion Oak subdivision. So a portion of that is affected by it. And that's about it. Thank you, George. Sure. Were there any other questions about the map? I do have it handy. I can pull it back up at any time. All right, so the exciting part's over. Now we're going to talk about a bunch of text related to noise exposures and why we're protecting them. And I may ask Robin to step back up and talk about some of these, um, particularly the noise exposure maps and why the contours are put in place. So if you... So this explains how the noise contours were actually generated using the FAA's approved aviation environmental design tool. And the day and night average sound level or DNL methodology was adopted, which is also FAA approved under FAR part um, 150. Um, so that we wanted to include in here a description of how those were and how the, the, there will be actually a map included. Um, as you just saw, that will clearly show um, where those extend to. And of course, the land use table says at what point those would be um, subjected to a land use decision. Um, aside from that, the next one is, uh, I, uh, before I leave there, 5.2.4. Does anybody have any more questions on the noise exposure maps? Otherwise known as noise contours. Okay. 5.2. 2.5 is general obstruction and airspace requirement. This actually section was largely um, borrowed <laughs> from other airports in the state. This is very common language. It refers to the 20,000 feet out from the runway ends that needs to be evaluated for the FAA base evaluation. What happens is the FAA makes the determination and we talk about what happens if it's a no hazard determination, then, then the, that particular layer will be satisfied in the um, evaluation of that structure. Um, a permit will not be issued if the determination of hazard is issued, meaning it's a hazard to um, air navigation or if it's conditions that do impose or affect um, limits on airport operations. These are also, um, go ahead, Tom. No. Is, it, I is saw there it. anything new in this? I mean, this is already pretty much in place. This, this is what's required under FAR Part 77, which is a federal regulation. We are reflecting it in our ordinance, okay, so as it is reflected through much most of the ordinances throughout the state of Arizona and in, in there. So essentially, we're not adding anything. We're just simply stating in this ordinance <coughs> it's already existing. We're, we're including it. I'm sorry, we're including it in the local document for clarity and to allow people to just look in one place, rather than us say, "Oh, you have to go and look at the FAA to see what the other requirements <coughs> are." So we're reflecting those federal requirements here for simplicity and to consolidate them. Thank you. 
so we look at the um, what happens with new development and natural growth associated with new development. They must complete forms associated with this chapter, and we're actually creating a, um, some, uh, a package. And so this points to that package. It's a very similar package to the one that's used at Scottsdale very successfully to help guide folks through this process because there are these layers of analysis. So it's basically saying you must get a copy of the package and complete the form so that we can get the analysis going and you have the guidance you need. It also states that we are preserving those areas within the 25,000 foot radius that they do need to be able to have that federally <coughs> required base evaluation. It also states that any object more than 200 feet high shall also submit to the FAA the appropriate forms for evaluation. Again, completely the language from FAR Part 77. And that the owner of, of construction equipment, like a crane or something like that that's going to be on the site temporarily must also undergo this evaluation. So what happens is you're gonna build a home or, a, or, a, or some structure and it's 35 feet high and so you have an evaluation for that. But when the crane operator comes with the 100-foot crane for a temporary use, they also have to go through the same evaluative process. And then you want to go ahead and take it over from there? Okay. So one of the things that we're also looking at here is the fact that when things are developed on site, that changes can occur to them, specifically um, natural growth, such as trees. We often have a um, well-planted communities, well-planted in the version of a, a lot of landscaping associated with them, with newer design of communities. So there are benefits to those trees, but there are also potential negatives. The benefits are or reduces the heat island effect and preserves some of the rainwater in the area. The negative is that all of that rainwater and um, reduced heat increases the tree growth. So we have a concern about a tree that meets the requirements now, but five years from now or 10 years from now may have grown to the point where it be could become an obstruction, um, and, and that is covered by part of this process. And then the last section is a lot of other things that must be considered around the area of an airport. Aside from the natural growth George just mentioned, the construction equipment that I mentioned, large solar arrays that might create glare to a landing pilot might have to have a glare analysis. <coughs> um, folks aren't allowed to use lights or lasers, and we do get calls from the tower from a pilot that says, I've just been lasered, and there's actually a concern about use of lasers, and it's, it's a hindrance to pilots and air traffic control. Uh, Inflatables, and actually we included this because we know that um, if you're in a commercial operate, uh, commercial business, mm -hmm. if you put up one of those big inflatables that actually extends above the height of the building, we need to just consider that as a possible obstruction. Drones and airspace use. Um, drones are used a lot around airports, and there are specific, um, there's actually a specific piece of guidance in a federal regulation 107 that applies <laughs> to drones, but we do want to bring this to folks' attention, and then, of course, new development. So what are we looking at? Anything that may create electrical interference as a problem to controlling aircraft, something that might make it difficult for pilots to distinguish between airport lights and other lights, so huge lighting arrays. Um, Christmas decorations at the end of the runway. Um, anything that might create glare affecting pilots, impair the visibility, create a potential wildlife strike hazard, and that includes something like putting a dump at the end of the runway because that can draw wildlife, mm. and also endangering or interfering with aircraft takeoff, landing, or maneuvering is covered. So those are the things that we look at. Um, these are more rare, but when they happen, they can be uh, really debilitating to a pilot, or frankly, um, we've gotten calls from air traffic control in the past that there have been lighting issues that are hindering them from seeing landing aircraft. Anyone who's lived here for 10 years or so will probably recall at some point seeing Lamb Chevrolet flying an inflatable lamb above their building that was 20 feet long and about 80 feet up in the air above the building. So it does happen. Something we need to take into consideration is that um, even as technology changes, some things don't, and balloons and inflatable devices are certainly something that could occur. We have language specifically in here relating to existing truck structures and natural growth. I talked just a moment ago about trees that will grow. We do have to monitor situations where those trees are in an area where they currently meet requirements, but perhaps just barely, 
and have the potential for growing up to a point where they don't meet requirements. That's something that we would look at, and there's a couple of ways that we can control those. One is through species determination when someone proposes landscaping. Um, generally speaking, the landscaping we're talking about is not an individual's backyard. They're landscaping in large areas of commercial centers or they're landscaping for a subdivision-wide landscape plan, which the city does look at. We look at it for a couple of reasons. One is water consumption, but the other is we have a limitation on, on species based on water uses. We use um, recommendations from the Department of uh, Water Resources already for determining what, what landscape materials we have. Part of our review, one of the things we can look at is the expected mature height of vegetation as part of that review process. So we're not creating a new process, we're simply adapting an existing process to monitor this. I also talked a little bit about non-conforming structures. Uh, because we borrowed, as Robin said, um, planners usually just call it stealing. We stole from Scottsdale a lot of the language. One of the things we did was carry over into the document that we gave you uh, their non-conforming use criteria, which is not our non-conforming use criteria. So we've shown that as deleted. We don't want to create something new just for this if we already have criteria in place in the Land Development Code. Again, the Land Development Code criteria is very clear. We've been using it for 20 years to address nonconforming uses. We don't want to change it. So, and I apologize. I didn't realize that I had done that when we first submitted it, and then we had a discussion at the um, Mayor's Ad Hoc Committee meeting a week ago, and it became pretty evident that that section was different than the rest of the city code. Can I ask a question? Certainly. It is in the city code, if I recall correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, if a building loses 50% of its value through some process and it's a non-conforming use, that is not allowed to go back and build again. Is that correct? Not under the city's land development code. So our land development code that controls um, most of what happens with a, a building that may lose its <coughs> non-conformance um, allows for structures to be returned to their previous state if they're lost through some action other than the control of the property owner. A lightning strike causes a fire. Um, a car runs into a building, something like that. They can be restored to their existing condition at the time that the disaster or, or damage happened. The only time when a rule similar to the 50% rule comes into play is a FEMA requirement relating to floodways, and it's based on the valuation of the structures. It's rather complex to administer. We don't want to recreate that with this code. So our existing code would say if your house is hit by lightning and it burns down and you're in an area where we don't allow houses, you build the house back. If you come in and demolish your house voluntarily, you don't get to put your house back because you did it under your own control and are subject to the requirements of the city's codes. So, so we protect people from disasters that are outside of their control. So given the fact that some of these houses around, this, around the golf course and such now are bordering 50, 60 years old, um, if I wanted to tear down a house that was too old you know, and, and rebuild another one in there, I'm not allowed to do that? By typical procedures, no. You would have to conform to the current code at the time of your reconstruction. Again, this is if you voluntarily reconstruct it. General maintenance, um, even additions and remodels are all possible without violating the nonconforming use requirements. So you could do substantial work on the house to bring it up to current code. You could even do additions to the house as long as they don't impact the various issues that we have here. Generally, height is the issue uh, without triggering the, the prohibition. So if you decide to scrape the lot flat and start over, yes, you're subject to the requirements of this code. It means I can't do it. Effectively, if you're within a 55 DNL or one of the impact zones that say no residential, you wouldn't be able to do it. Hmm. There's a problem there. Okay. The next section is, do you have more questions about that? <clears throat> I have more questions about this section. Um, you have in 5.2.6C, uh, 
It says the city may require the owner of a structure constructed prior to the effective date of this code to install marking and lighting on the structure if the city deems it necessary for airport safety. This marking and lighting shall be installed, operated, and maintained at the owner's expense. So in other words, you're going to say, well, look, we want you to do this to your building, and you got to do it. You have to put this all in that. It just, it just doesn't strike me as being fair. I mean, I think that there's got to be some thing in there. The city says, look, we, we need to talk about this. We need to figure out how this is going to happen. Just to simply say, thou shall, you know, in this particular instance, it's, I find it inconsistent with the values that this city has had, at least for the 40 some odd years I've been here. Do we have other comments associated with that? I mean, this is the time for input from, from the commission to give us direction if Things, if you believe things need to be changed, now's the time to tell us to go and look at those changes. Could you give an example of how this would be applicable? Are we talking like if we have a church spire, or are we talking like if we have a house that is 20 feet off the ground? It's more likely to occur with taller structures and less likely to be a residential building. It could be an industrial or commercial building that perhaps is in an area where um, the, the aircraft overflight would be such that a, the height of the structure could be a problem for aircraft if it's not lighted, and therefore we we're asking that it have some kind of markers established so that aircraft coming and going would be able I, to see it. I certainly I, understand. I don't, I don't, I understand yeah, I don't hear an objection to that. It's the who pays for it. Correct. Um, My, and I'd just like to clarify something I think may, may be really important to this discussion, and that is that an, an obstruction evaluation was done in, the most current one was done by the FAA as part of a recent update um, in 2017. And an owner would have been contacted had there been an issue. So we, we up to 2017, they, we've already evaluated all those obstructions that existed as of that point. And so there would be nothing that was in place as of 2017 that would probably be subjected to this. After that date, they should have gone through the 7460 process, and that would have been revealed to them if they would have given the accurate height of the object that they would have been told at that time if lighting was required, and that won't have changed since that point. So the, inc the incidence of this happening would be somebody since 2017 who did not file a 7460 and did not get the feedback that you needed a light at that time. And generally, those are going to be commercial structures right in the area of the airport. I doubt if it would apply to a single house. This just, to, just to clarify. <coughs> Thank you for that clarification. And I'd like to point out that this does not say what you just said. This does not say that. This simply says that if you decide somebody needs a light on their building, they're required to put that light on their building. And what I just heard was there really isn't going to be that kind of a situation because of all the stuff we've already done and all the rules that are currently in place. Then let's say that in here. Yeah, and I, I think we could probably yeah. reflect that. Um, it would be this situation where the entity did not follow Part 77 since 2017. The other thing that I would like to see in here, um, but I, I don't, I, I just can't accept the fact that if I want to come in and if I wanted to tear down my house for a variety of different reasons, you know, and build a new one in there to replace it, same size, whatever, and everything, I can't do that. I just, what is the difference? Why is the code making the distinction between lightning striking my house and me striking my house? <laughs> Uh, it's the voluntary nature of it. If you choose to do it, you have a choice. Do it or don't do it. If lightning strikes your house, you don't have a choice. The, the consistency that we've had throughout the rest of the code regarding nonconforming uses is based on the concept, a zoning concept, that the nonconforming uses can remain so you're not penalizing people for changes that we've made. But the ultimate goal is to have everybody in conformance. It's to ultimately bring everyone into conformance with the code requirements. Now, that may take 100 years um, with life of structures, for instance. But the purpose is not to make the nonconformance continue permanently. <coughs> it's to provide some encouragement, if you want to call it prohibition encouragement, um, to eventually reach conformance with the code requirements. So we do that with every other code we have. If you have a nonconformance 
non-conforming sign, non-conforming residence in an industrial area, non-conforming commercial building in a residential area. Those uses can stay, but if you remove them, we want that residential area to be protected as residential. We want that commercial area to be protected as commercial. We want your oversized sign to meet our sign requirements so that I get you're all consistent. that, George. I get it, all that. The I, same thing applies under these circumstances. I get all that. I'm just having a very difficult time with somebody wanting to come in. I may have you know, structural reasons, uh, pest reasons, whatever it might be, for tearing down the house and starting over again. And this code is saying that I can't, the current code says I can't do that. And I think that that's an effect that, uh, it, it, I think it's a flaw in the code. And I, I, I can't accept that being part of this. I don't know how anybody else feels about it, but. Any other comments on that? This is, this is, it would help us to hear from the rest of you know what direction we should go with, with modifying this or not modifying this. Tom, I think that's excellent input. Okay. I'm not seeing a lot of heads nodding. I'm not getting very much <laughs> consensus. What, one of the options that we could address is the and it would it's going to create a section that's different than the standard that we use throughout the rest of the LDC, that replacing a structure to the exact dimensions of a pre-existing structure would be permitted. It's not something we have in any other portion of our code, but that's something that we could work up language and let you look at before you take action on this, either at your next meeting, which is going to be a public hearing, or whenever you are at a point where you can. Um, or feel ready to make a recommendation to move it on to council. Uh, that is something I can get language together for and provide it back to you for your next meeting and give you an option of, of two options. That we would be creating something that's not applicable otherwise in the Land Development Code. I, you think know, I, can, I can see two points here. You know, if you had a house that has termites and you're going to have to tear it down because of that, that really wasn't your choice to have termites. Mm -hmm. But if you go, you know, I don't like Spanish style, I want to go New England cottage, that's your choice to tear it down. So how do you de define that part? You know, I, I, again, I'm thinking about the overall impact. Um, a house is a house is a house. Whether it be uh, I tear it down because I don't like it, or I tear it down because it's structurally unsound, or I tear it down because lightning struck it. I mean, it's still, there's a house going back there. There's a house there now. There'll be a house there then. It should be allowed. I think, you know, having two options <clears throat> to take a look at it, and then we can decide what option we like. Sure. We, we can bring back language that would give you a choice to insert here a particular section with language that addresses it the way you, you want to recommend sure, thank to council. You. I would appreciate that. Hmm? Uh, the airport would like to state that... Um, we don't want to do something that natively impacts, you know, individual homeowners, and that's why we were completely an advocate to have this removed. Um, our honestly, if it was built back and it was not above the current height, and as long as an abrogation easement was signed, that absolves the city of liability because you built back in an, in an impact area and you chose to do that, we wouldn't have a problem with that, and that's already required under the AIA. So I, I would feel supportive of. Excellent. That that option, um, because I don't see where that would pose any greater of a hazard, and the easement will would allow us to not have it used against us. That we allowed that non-conforming use to be. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing the language. Very good. I'm going to let Robin talk about this section again. So don't sit down. So this is referring to the critical airspace services specifically. It lists the, the following critical airspace services, the impact zones, the noise contours, the FAR Part 77 airspace services, which are that FAA base process, and the airline one engine inoperative departure services, otherwise known as OEI, the OEI splay or pathway. Together, these require special protections. And so what we say in this, this section is any negative impact shall be grounds to deny or require modification of building permits or development permits to eliminate or mitigate such impacts. And we did say that also natural growth could adversely impact some of these critical air, airspace um, uh, surfaces so that we, they may be grounds to deny or require modification of building permits. Any questions yes. on this section? 
Okay. So this is uh, taking largely the language that currently existed within the code with just a couple of little tweaks for clarification. And, and basically, as has been since 2001, prior to the issuance of any building or development permit for property within the airport influence area, the owner of said property shall provide the city of Prescott with a navigation easement. So this easement, um, there's a copy of it. If you would like to review it, we can provide it. It's been the easement that's been in place for two years now. Mm -hmm. The, the version that we've used. But there has been a history of easements um, in the city archives, um, obviously all the way back to 2001. Um, <coughs> this is a recorded, uh, it's, it's already been recorded. The airport influence area has been a recorded map. And so it is the same influence area as it was in 2001. We're making no changes to that. And um, I think you did some examples of permitting. If you'd like to go ahead and do that paragraph, mm -hmm. second one. So in order to be able to affect the acquisition of these easements, it would be during the review and approval process. If someone comes to us for a building permit or if someone comes to us, to, to us with a <coughs> new subdivision, those are the times when we would obtain those easements. It's a time when we're already asking for a lot of documentation from property owners, including agreement to comply with city codes. Part of applying to us means that you're agreeing to apply city codes to your development. This would be simply part of that process. We're not creating anything new uh, by doing this. We're just asking for additional documentation during that submittal. So, George, now I can see if you got property within the city limits, they have to go through certain procedures and so forth. So we have some control. The third paragraph says areas within the airport influence area may lie outside the corporate limit of the city and an easement will be required. How are you going to make someone who's outside the city who doesn't have to go through the city procedures to build something sign that? I have an answer for you. Good. Uh, one of the things that we see often is developments near the, the city. They're adjacent to the city. We don't have zoning control outside the corporate limits of the city. We simply don't. It, there's no way to do that. But we do have control over applying city infrastructure outside the city. A development outside the city potentially could get water through certain processes or get sewer service through certain processes or get other city services through certain processes that city council has in place. If we put this in effect and you have a request for services that are outside the corporate limits, we can condition those services. We already do condition those services in most cases. This would apply an additional condition. You would have to provide us with an easement if you're getting services like you're in the city, then you're going to provide us an easement as if you were inside the city. And it's perfectly legal to do that. Um, we, we would simply add that as an additional condition to an agreement to provide services outside of the city. I can see that. If so, But if someone <coughs> in the county decides they want to build a house, we can't do anything about that. No, nope, not unless they're asking to build a house connected to the city's water system. Right. And then we have some controls over it. Again. You're contracting with us when you ask for services outside our corporate limits. It's, it's a different than an expectation of services inside our corporate limits. So if you're asking for something, some, yeah, we can ask for something back. Theoretically, there are, even though small number, cases where we couldn't require this to be done. Uh, development in the county without any connection to city services is beyond our control. Okay. I seem to recall a time when we actually had IGAs into governmental agreements with Prescott Valley and uh, Yavapai County with regards to the airport. We, we had an IGA with each of Prescott Valley and um, I believe with Chino Valley and an agreement with the county. I don't know if it was a formal IGA. I can't okay. recall. Uh, all have since um, expired. Those agreements were actually created and, and adopted at the time of the airport specific area plan adoption because the boundary of that is much larger than what we're looking at here and impacts all of those communities. We got them all together at a table and had a conversation about the impacts and everyone came to an agreement uh, on those things and then we entered into intergovernmental agreements with some of those entities. Uh, none of those exist currently. There's no reason why they can't <coughs> be constituted. It just requires negotiation it's with all those. It's up to council to decide that, but I think it's a good idea. 
we would agree that's a good idea. And that is actually why the map was recorded in the county, is because at that time it applied to multiple jurisdictions, the in airport influence area. Again, as I mentioned earlier, we're using an existing airport influence area boundary as the boundary for the AVO because it's already existing, already defined. This section just simply puts out the definition of that boundary by parcel numbers and section numbers. The fair notice disclosure, Robin may want to add some additional information to this, but the fair notice disclosure is something that is a, a notice to property owners or renters that you're near an airport, you potentially could experience overflight and impact <coughs> from those overflights, and it gives us some protection for um, complaints against us. They have been advised that you're about to rent or buy near the airport, and if you choose to do that, then we are held somewhat less responsible for you not liking the fact that we operate an airport nearby that you should have known about when you bought your house. This gives us that extra layer of protection of requiring these notices occur at certain times and requiring that these notices are made to both property owners during a purchase and renters during a rental agreement. Um, they can be done in, in multiple different ways, but this is the way that gives us the best protections. Yep. And the application for development package that was referenced earlier will include a copy of the sample fair notice disclosure so they have the document. This is very similar to what they did at Scottsdale. It's in their fair notice disclosure, in their packet. And then also it's very similar to the Deepwell Ranch fair notice disclosure that's already incorporated as part of their development agreement. A couple of things, if I might. Sure. Uh, one of the things is you don't reference, <coughs> excuse me, this does not reference renters. It only references owners. I think the word renters should be put in there as well. Uh, we do have the word renter. Each owner of property located when the AVO boundary shall make a fair disclosure to each purchaser or oh, renter. Okay, right. yeah, I missed that. Thank so you. the first one is the property owner is responsible for providing it, but he has to How provide it that? to future owners or renters. I think it's incredibly important because this airport influence area is huge. You know, like if I bought something over in the Granite Dells, I would not necessarily think that I'm in an airport influence area. You know, and not necessarily, that probably wouldn't come to mind. So how are the consumers notified? They're with these fair, is it part of that stack of papers that you sign at a closing? To some degree, about 50 yes, that's where some of this will occur. Um, we're, we're encouraging other approaches as well, such as providing the notification um, at sales offices for new subdivisions so that people see it when they come in. We don't specify all of the requirements here, but we can get into more detail if you think that's helpful. I, yeah, I think that the way that the way that the city requests or has the fair notice disclosures in place, I think it needs to have more teeth in it. I think, and I don't know exactly how to do that, okay. but uh, I think that, um, in my opinion, I think that this particular paragraph needs a little bit more teeth in order to be able to make sure that the consumer, not only the first purchaser of the house, but the second and the third, right. or the first renter and the second renter and the third renter, on, 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 is notified in a way that it is, it's obvious that they've been notified. I mean, just having them sign one of those 50 pieces of paper is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. No, I, I understand that uh, legally that's notice, but if we can make it easier and more obvious, we'll see what language we can come up to do that. Yeah, and it'd be nice to see that people are notified perhaps <clears throat> prior to the fact that they get to the closing at the title company, um, that they're notified that they're in this, in this area. It has to be part of the sales process or something like that so that I'm not sitting there, you know, looking at a document when I've decided to buy a $600,000 home, and I say, oh, I didn't know this. Be because it was on page 843 of the packet exactly. they gave you the initial, I know. Uh, it just needs to have, I think it needs a little bit more teeth. We'll see and if I, we can come I up agree with language with to help on this too. You know, we need to make sure that a purchaser or a renter specifically knows this, not just here's one of the forms you got to sign here and you're going through this and you're signing and signing and signing, but specifically acknowledges they know this. And we'll it needs bring to you occur back some suggested language. language. Or the we'll bring lease. You back suggested language. Or the lease. George Tom here. Um, I recall, and I'm not sure where, but I recall um, driving around an airport area that had signs placed on every roadway 
almost on every corner that said um, uh, air, airport noise risk or something to that effect. Low flying aircraft. E every block had a, you, you couldn't miss it. M most of the roadways in most of the subdivisions that have occurred so far near the airport are public roads and the, the city could post such signs. That, that's another thing that we could recommend here. It wouldn't be in the ordinance, but it could be a recommendation you make to council. Yeah, that might be a little tough to do. <coughs> Agreed, and, and I just want to point out that some of those signs have um, come up missing. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we think they might be in a student's dorm room. We're not sure. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, they're pretty popular. But the low-flying aircraft, as well as the, um, the directional and mileage signage that you probably have seen in Pinion Oaks, um, we added that about three years ago. Um, and to be quite honest with you, it's because there's a large group of renters in there who really didn't know or made the decision somewhere else to rent remotely. And so we wanted to make sure that folks knew the proximity to the airport if they were indeed a renter and did not have the traditional notifications associated with a purchase. George, along with the fair notice disclosure, we're putting the burden on the owner of the property to make this. How do we let all property owners owners know about this, you know, especially like a single family dwelling who's now going to lease the house out. How do we get this information out to them that if this becomes applicable, they need to be aware of this? We are still working out a process to make this available to everyone who needs it. Um, that's something that we haven't gotten in place yet. It obviously needs to be made aware to individual property owners, and there are various methods of notification that we use. We're holding a public hearing on this um, at your next meeting on the 25th, and we're about to send out over 2,000 notices to people within the boundary. That's a possibility. If this ordinance is adopted by council, we may mail requirement notices to every property owner who is affected by it. That lists what they have to do, including the requirements for fair notice. So that is still a possibility of using an old-fashioned snail mail approach of sending them a notice. So just to make um, a kind of clarify, the packet that they're required to pick up and complete and then submit back through the permitting portal, they actually are to attach the fair notice that they are planning to use for any new development. So we actually get the opportunity to see it and vet it before we issue a permit that's relating to any new parcels. It's the existing, it's the existing. users yeah. that you know will have to help to educate. But clearly, we've embedded within the new process going forward this type of notification and a disclosure process that they have to follow that we can approve. So that's something we may have some additional information for you at the time of the public hearing at the end of the month. Um, penalty section, uh, every, every city code has a penalty requirement that's established already in the city code. <laughs> this section would be enforced through that same process. Um, we have various maps listed here. Most of those we've compacted for you for the discussion purposes into a couple of maps that just simply have all of those contours and layers on them. When this becomes an ordinance format to move out of this body and onto the city council, we'll probably change this list to, to have that consolidated map because it's easier for most people to use a single map to find everything than have multiple maps attached. And that's basically the end of the document. Um, if you have any questions beyond what you've asked so far, don't hesitate to contact us. Um, we know how shy you can be. You have to overcome that. Um, give us questions. We will answer them to the best of our ability, or we will bring you answers at your public hearing so that it's evident that you've asked questions and we've answered them for you during that process. Um, while this is not a public hearing, staff is finished with its presentation. If you desire to take public comment, you're welcome to do so, and we will pay attention to those public comment. Any George. last questions? Yeah, I'd like to, I'd like to make a comment uh, for the benefit of the commissioners and the public out there. Uh, when the Planning Commission is uh, presented with a proposal, Commissioners can look at the same set of information and come to different conclusions. And uh, the public can look at the same information and come to a different conclusion than the commissioners. One of the reasons I 
suggested a task force to look at the airport is I think the airport should be held to a higher standard so that when we're looking at a proposal, we're more in concert with the public. And, and that's the whole idea behind transparency. Uh, I wanted to compliment uh, Dr. Swoboda for a very thorough presentation and city staff also for a very thorough presentation. I think this is a great first start. There's some tweaking to be done, but it gets us back to a better level of transparency so that the commissioners and the public can see a proposal from the same perspective. So thank you. And from a staff perspective, we absolutely agree with that. When, when this document ultimately gets approved, should council approve it, we want something that's clear to the public so that we don't get questions about uh, interpretations. It's clear to us for in processing side of it. We, we don't want to end up having questions ourselves. And obviously, if it requires a project come before you, clear for you so that you can process and make your determination as easily as possible. Tom? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Tom Riley. One of the things, we're essentially changing zoning here. That's correct. This is a zoning overlay. It's a rezoning. Okay, so if I were to rezone a piece of property or request a rezoning on a piece of property, wouldn't I be required to have neighborhood meetings? Not by our code. That's what our public hearing process is for. We invite the public to the public hearing to have those meetings. We encourage neighborhood meetings when a developer is proposing something um, to vet it out at the, the development level before he brings it to us for a formal public hearing. So we encourage neighborhood meetings, but they're not required by code. Why didn't you do that here? Because of the area that's covered by this. It's such a large area, and it's something that has been in the process. Again, this is the fourth public meeting to talk about it, that we believe that sending notices to um, all of the folks who are going to potentially be affected by it or those who are within the boundaries of it and having a public hearing is the process to follow. Wouldn't that be consistent with transparency? Public hearings are transparent. Well, but letting people know what's happening to that, the potential of what this overlay is going to do and how it might affect them. And you're doing it through the public process, but yet you encourage developers to do another process, which is to go out and do this. So we're not being consistent. And I guess my objection is not the fact that the airport needs protection. There's, I'm not objecting to that. I am objecting as to how it's being done. I don't think it's consistent with the values that this community has set forth. And I think that because of that, I'm having a tough time going through this process, and I'll have a very tough time voting on anything as far as a recommendation is concerned until I see you know, the public being notified, which they haven't been yet. And I, I find that disturbing, to say the so, least. So we, we have done a couple of things to get notice out to the public. One is we publish your upcoming public hearing. That's been published in the newspaper. We're going to send out postcards inviting people to attend the meeting and to contact us for questions about it today that will go out to 2,400 and some odd <laughs> residences or property owners in town. You say you've done that or you're going to do that? That will go out today. Oh. We've, we've cleaned out every um, done it yet. office. We've cleaned out every office supply company in town of postcard material because that's being printed up and sent out today. We published the notification. We're required to publish it a minimum of 15 days in advance, and we've You're done that 21 days. I, I know I'm going legal. through all of the steps that were required. You've, you've gone through all the legal steps that you need to go through, yeah. and I'm not discussing the legal steps. I'm talking about the values that we have as a community, about keeping each other informed, mm -hmm. you know, and to have to not have done this in a transparent fashion to begin with, I find disturbing. And I believe we've done this transparently. I don't think you have. Not like you require others to do it. It's a different standard. We, we've, we've done some meetings with some areas of town that are impacted by this, primarily because we know they're already nonconforming where they are now. Prior to this adoption, should it occur, they're already nonconforming. We met with neighbors in those areas. We haven't met with all of the areas that are affected by this. <coughs> What areas are those, George? You're in the immediate vicinity of the airport, the golf course community and the areas that are just in the vicinity of uh, McCurdy, 
drive that goes into the airport off of 89 mm -hmm. neighborhoods there that are long existing neighborhoods that are non-conforming under our current rules we met with those to talk about those current rules and the non-conformance thank you um, if if your suggestion is to break this up and have individual neighborhood meetings that is certainly something you guys can recommend we do before we move this any further we do have a public hearing scheduled you will have a public hearing on the 25th whatever else we do so we we can certainly move beyond that if that's, if that's the recommendation of this body well i would certainly recommend letting, making more people aware of this mm -hmm. than not I mean, it's better late than never, I suppose. Yeah, and how many uh, how many people were invited to the? Uh, we had uh, just so you know, we had open houses. They were actually held at the airport terminal. It was about a month and a half ago. Yeah. Two hundred and fifty or so. So properties were noticed in that one. All properties that were in impact zones one, two, and three, directly adjacent to the airport, all received notices. We had what eighty to one hundred people, people. Um, come and they asked questions about the non-conforming uses and so there was a lot of education that occurred and to be honest with you the most common comment was yeah I know I live next to an airport um, well, there yeah, were, most people do yeah and I know that planes may <laughs> crash and in fact people are saying well is this the one on the runway extension I want to hear about the runway extension and by the way can't we make the extension longer um, it, I mean we had oh. no negative comments most of, people who live in the airport, and my son-in-law, yeah. my stepson is, is one of them. Um, they know they live in an airport. Most of them like living by an airport. Yeah. And so we were really pleasantly surprised that there was, n there were no concerns expressed whatsoever in any of the impact zones one, two, and three, which were the most heavily impacted areas. Off the end, every single person was notified, and we had multiple sessions. Tom, do you have a particular area that you think the notification should go out to? Everything and so, well, there's. It's been suggested that the most, I wouldn't say the most strict restrictions that are going to be putting in here are inside the um, airport impact area and also the 55 DNL. So everybody, at least that's going to be in that area, okay. should be notified. And the notification we're sending out is actually to everyone within the airport in, uh, influence area even if they're outside of that, those impact zones. That's so that will cover <clears throat> everyone who potentially will have some impact, whether or not it's practically likely to happen or not. Any other questions for staff? Well, no, but Don, are we gonna take public comment at this meeting today? Okay. Yes. Perfect, thanks. I'll shut up <laughs> for a while. So, any other questions of staff? Can I just... Um, yes, Matt follow-up uh, prior to obviously the public hearing or the public taking public comment there were two things you wanted us to go back and look at at staff maybe a little bit closer and come back with some options uh, and I may have missed some so George if you picked up any prior to this but it was 5.26 D requiring potential options uh, on non-conforming uses and that one you may get some pushback from the legal department <laughs> uh, on that, you, you don't want to set a standard in one uh, overlay zone that's inconsistent with existing code. And there may be some state statutes. I was kind of quickly looking at my, my phone. I didn't find any. I don't know if Joe did, but I'm sure that kind of piqued his red flag lawyer brain as to whether or not we're going to change the code, which would be entirely inconsistent with what everyone else in Arizona does, municipalities. Uh, but I, I just wanted to say, you know, be prepared <laughs> for a potential discussion on that. The other one I saw was 5.28, uh, kind of putting more teeth into the disclosures, especially to renters as they kind of go from one rental to another rental to another rental. And we'll look at that as well. Uh, George, from a staff perspective, did you see any other major issues that no, we need to come back with other than us implementing the the um, <coughs> the comments that we've already shown the, the red line strike through comments that we've already shown that would be something that we would follow up so your next document would, would uh, eliminate those things that that we uh, proposed from a staff level to remove or modify so yeah I have the same list did we miss anything and, and the first one's going to require a little bit of legal research, but we'll certainly get back to you. <clears throat> the one thing that I had mentioned that really doesn't have much to do with the legal issues is the values that the community has. And I'm wondering, and this, this whole process, and well as the uh, overlay, 
needs to be sifted through that value system to determine its efficacy, in my opinion. And I don't, I don't, I haven't heard that discussion happen yet, but maybe it will. Since this is the fourth meeting, I thought maybe it's time to bring it up. This is actually the second meeting where we've had the document draft to actually look at. The first two meetings were preparatory. Here's what we're going to do. And then when we started with the um, mayor's ad hoc committee, we actually had a draft completed that we could talk about specifically line by line. So this is, this is a little early in the draft review process, only the second meeting. But it's important that you have a look at it and have an opportunity to ask us questions before we get to a public hearing so that we have a document that we know you're at least familiar with before that process starts. That doesn't mean we don't want to hear public comment between now and then. We certainly do. Any other questions of staff? Uh, I'd like to make a comment. Um, back to the beginning of the meeting, we talked about this, this special adjustments that are going to have to take place. And it goes without saying, but m my hope would be that the city keeps its promises, number one, um, and operates under an umbrella of trust and respect to those stakeholders that, in fact, are going to be impacted by this. Okay. Any others? I would echo that. I'm going to open it up for public comment. Uh, when you come up, please give your name and address. Council Member Rusin has asked if she could speak first, so I'm going to grant that. Then we'll go from there. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Kathy Rusin. I'm Mayor Pro Tem, and I would like to thank staff, Robin and George, for their comprehensive review today. It was wonderful. Um, I would like to respectfully address this commission and give you my perspective as a council member and elected official. Please note that my comments are my own and I am not speaking for the rest of council. And of course, I'm not giving any legal advice. We need to codify the AVO because it will become an enforceable part of the code. Right now, we have no legal teeth to prevent daycare, schools, churches, and homes to be built in the crash zones. We already have a church permitted by the city that was constructed, constructed in the crash zone. It's one too many. The AVO will not affect structures already in place or that have received approval for a final plat. Not one house of the 10,500 approved for Deepwell Ranch will be prevented from being built. AVOs have been commonly used since the 1960s. Also, it will give home buyers and renters proper notice of possible noise impacts. If we don't approve this district, it might possibly negatively impact the runway extension, thereby jeopardizing our commercial air service and compromising our U.S. Forest Service slurry bombers' capacity to fight fires as they will not be able to fly fully loaded with slurry. The longer runway will increase traffic safety. I'm sure you all remember our recent Crooks fire. A municipality such as Prescott can exercise something commonly known as policing powers. This is the city's regulatory authority to protect the public's health, safety, and welfare. This power is a basic right given to the states and their political subdivisions and is protected under the 10th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. This right must not be abused and must be used for legitimate public purposes, and it should be reasonable. Also, the courts have recognized that private property is subject to regulation in the public interest. We have to be mindful that we are not also somehow instituting a delay or moratorium. We are within our rights to do research and implement an AVO district first. Any so-called delay is for a limited dura duration. Our target is the end of September. We are acting properly 
and promptly and expeditiously to research and implement the ABO district. We are not sitting on our hands. Finally, let the lesson be learned. A city should never allow a developmental agreement and annexation to be exempt from our city zoning ordinances. We are solely responsible for public health, safety, and welfare. That is not the builders and developers' responsibility, and it should not be left to them. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, did I hear you correctly saying that the land that's part of the Deep Well Ranch that we got on the map today, that the, the housing that is zoned in that area right now is not going to be affected by this? I'm saying that they've been approved for 10,500 homes, and they will be able to build all those homes. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. I will open up. Kaylee, do we have anybody signed up to want to present to us? I have no comment cards, but uh, there may if still be anybody folks else who out speak. there who would like to, if you would raise your hand or if you want to get in line, but I'll recognize each one as they come. Sir? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. My name is Stephen Polk. I'm here on behalf of James Deepwell Ranch and the James Foundation. With me on behalf of James Deepwell Ranch today is John Martin, attorney for Deepwell Ranch, as well as Ron James and Jenna James. First, I do have a little housekeeping item. I, I think staff has made it abundantly clear that today is not a public hearing, uh, but to the extent there is some discussion of public hearing in the beginning, I'm, I'm lodging an objection and just making it clear. This is not a public hearing and we'd like to see that process go forward properly. The other request I would make is for future agendas, that we do a better job agendizing, whether you'll take public comment, particularly on this important community issue. I personally know there would be many other property owners here today if it was understood that there would be public comment and input from them. Now, now I want to communicate that Ron James and the James Family Foundation is deeply committed to this community. We support the economic health and vitality of our community, and we recognize the importance of the airport. But you need to know that nobody will be more affected by this AVO than James Depot Ranch. We have a master plan in place. There's already an airport noise overlay for this. We've already gone over these issued issues and protected the airport. <clears throat> And you need to know as commissioners that if the city enacts this AVO over the vested property rights of Deepwell Ranch, it will be a taking of private property rights. Now the Fifth Amendment of the US Constitution prohibits the taking of public property without just compensation. And I know all of you today support the Constitution. When you were sworn in as public officers, you swore that you would uphold the laws of the state of Arizona the Constitution of Arizona, and the U.S. Constitution. And that includes the Fifth Amendment and the related amendment, or, and the related rights under the, US, under the Arizona Constitution. So you have to ask yourselves as commissioners, can the city fully compensate the private property owners for the takings that will happen if this AVO is enacted? Because to date, James Deepwell Ranch has not received adequate assurances of this and we are deeply concerned. Now you heard today the FAA has already granted $50 million to Prescott Regional Airport, and there's another 100 million in grant commitments over the next five to six years. Now the Deepwell Ranch Master Plan was adopted in 2017. The FAA is fully aware of the planned development in and around the airport and yet they will be giving us an additional $100 million to develop this. Now staff has represented that the existing entitlements will be preserved and exempted from the AVO. Deepwell Ranch is a master plan community. We have a development agreement. We have vested development rights. So we need some clarity. Will we be exempted? 
will all the properties within Depot Ranch Master Plan be exempted? I think you as commissioners should request to see this on a map. You need to know what properties will be exempted from this AVO before you can make a, a fully informed decision. Now current FAA guidance centers around the 65 DNL level. That's the current guidance. You heard today recommendations from staff that the city be more aggressive than that, be more onerous on private property rights, that you extend that past the 60 DNL level, all the way to the 55 DNL level. That is a huge expansion over what the FAA, this current guidance is. So you need to ask yourself if you can support this taking of private property rights just to protect new homeowners from noise when they are choosing to buy there. Are we prohibited from constructing new homes in the 55 DNL when the FAA doesn't have guidance recommending against that? And we already have the vested development rights to do so, and the homeowners are choosing to buy there. Is that consistent with our city's values? Now, we appreciate Commissioner Riley's comments today that greater transparency is required. So please hold our government to a higher standard. I attended the open house that was discussed as part of the community engagement process. And I just want to be clear for the record and for your understanding. The community, over the community open house had nothing to do with the AVO. That was about the airport impact zones. It was limited to those particular zones. And, and finally, I'll close with this. You know, you know we heard from, from Mayor Pro Tem Rusing that all 10,500 homes under the Depot Ranch Master Plan will be permitted to be constructed. But where? That's not what the AVO is showing us today. Where can we build those homes? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wish? Yes, sir. Good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Guerra. Last name is spelled G. Will you speak into the microphone? Mark? Good morning. My name is Mark Guerra. Last name is spelled G-U-E-R-R-A. I am general counsel for Chamberlain Development, LLC. I come from their corporate office down in Tempe. Um, I just have three brief points I wanted to make to this commission, and they will be brief. Um, first point, in 2017, the city, Chamberlain, and Deepwell Ranch entered into a binding development agreement and master plan for the specific uses of the property around this airport. Uh, the proposed AVO here prevents the very uses that had been contractually agreed in the development agreement and master plan. The moment that this proposed AVO is adopted, it would necessarily impair existing land rights and uses. Consider consideration must be given by this commission to the financial implications and potential liability that would be posed to the city should this AVO be adopted. At my direction earlier this week, I had 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 the law firm of Barry Rydell provide a formal written notice of impasse and notice of default under the development agreement, and we had published that notice to members of this commission as well as to the council. That notice serves as formal written objection by Chamberlain Development to this proposed AVO. Second point, the federal government through the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, has entirely preempted the field of regulation of airport noise. The federal government has absolute primacy over any local authority regarding regulation of airport noise. The FAA itself has conclusively established a 65 DNL, day, night, average sound level, as a level of noise compatible with most land uses. This proposed AVO would reduce the noise impact limit to 55 DNL, a level that has absolutely no basis in existing law. Chamberlain itself has applied for and received FAA approval for multiple projects within the proposed overlay <clears> zone, <throat> with the FAA making a specific determination of no hazard to air navigation after the FAA had conducted an aeronautical study. 
It is simply not for any local authority to unilaterally raise the bar. That is the very definition of an arbitrary and capricious action. Third point. To the extent that this commission has been led to believe that there's been some sort of change in federal law or state law that requires the imposition of this AVO, you have been entirely misled. There has been no such change. And in fact, the development agreement in this instance requires that there be a change in law since the development agreement in 2017 for there to be, for, for, to, to carry through to the development agreement. I want to impress upon this council that this AVO is not required by any federal standard nor by any state standard. Uh, my client does have vested development rights. It does intend to avail itself of all rights and remedies available under the development agreement if this proposed <coughs> AVO would be recommended and adopted. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wish to present? Yes, sir. My name is Ron James, 4985 North State Route 89, Prescott, and I'm part of the Depot Ranch. And I'd like to say that uh, I appreciate Mr. Riley in saying the transparency of this is absolutely none. Uh, uh, I actually had to ask George at the ad hoc committee if it was a public hearing or not, and I got the uh, got told that didn't have to notice because it wasn't a public hearing. It was a workshop, as well as this was supposed to be a workshop and not a public hearing. Uh, if this is the way our city is going to conduct transparency, I think you guys are in deep doo-doo. I also want to uh, say that uh, the airport manager states that we got $50 million since she's been here, and I applaud her for getting that. But then that's not consistent. Would that mean that the FAA people are complete idiots? That they would give $50 million and not have researched that there is a master plan out there adopted in 2017? They wouldn't have given $50 million if they thought this was going to be a hazard or anything. And then as Mr. Riley also probed, that this is a rezoning. So this F AVO is, n is not what it's uh, cracked up to be. It's actually a rezoning. And if you guys were to approve that, uh, I think you are uh, being led down a path that you are uh, approving and going against both state constitution and the federal constitution, as uh, Mr. Polk has told you. Uh, what you have heard today is not the, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You may have heard some of the truth, but you haven't heard the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Uh, I think we have the cart before the horse. Why hasn't the city talked to the major landowners? We have nitpicked the little landowners, but you haven't, the city hasn't talked to the major landowners to see if we could figure this out. Why haven't they done that? Is that transparency? I don't think so. Uh, and then the, the new uh, city attorney has told you, don't worry about the existing entitlements. We'll figure that out. Again, this is the cart before the horse. And I think you guys better take some time, figure this out, and why are we in such a hurry? Why is next, next meeting supposed to be your voting session? And as George said, you're going to vote for this. He's already preordained that this is going to pass. Wow, again, is that transparency? I really think, you guys, this is a bigger issue than they're, they're telling you it is. There's a lot more land involved than, uh, that, uh, than they're telling you it is. There's a big chunk of land here, and it affects us a lot, Chamberlain Development and many other people. So uh, I think you ought to slow this process down, do a little bit of research, uh, and, and make sure you know what you're doing. Because, again, you, you guys will be pawns in violating both the state constitution and the federal constitution. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anybody else from the public like to make a comment? Sandy? <coughs> Chairman Michaelman, commissioners, it's nice to see your smiling faces this morning. 
And might I add that uh, Sandy Griffiths is also a member of the Yavapai County Planning and Zoning Commission. Thank you for acknowledging that, Mr. Chairman Riley, and also a planning and zoning commissioner for the town of Prescott Valley. So I understand your hats and what each and every one of you do because it's not an easy job. Um, Sandy Griffiths, Yavapai County Contractors Association. Without a doubt, we all know that the airport is indeed essential, it's critical, and it's valuable to the lifeblood of this community. And we all want a successful airport. And Embry-Riddle is equally as valuable to our city. From the meetings I've attended, what I've watched and read, I feel that there is somewhat of a manufactured argument that if we allow residential in the 55 DNL zone where it is currently placed, that we are going to be inundated with highly agitated people calling and complaining about sound. We live in a complaint-driven world nowadays, every day, every day. In my position, I receive calls weekly from highly agitated individuals, from anything and everything. We are here not to be the judge for sound sensitivity. That's not your job, that's not my job. We're here to put together an AVO, which in my heart of hearts does have a lot of good components to it, but it needs rework. There are items in this AVO which are not beneficial to the city and to the stakeholders. I would like to see, number one, that we put the brakes on this a little bit. There's more work to be done. And when I put my commission hat on with my jurisdictions, our items brought forward to us, they are always sent out to other stakeholders in the community for comments, suggestions, and input. This AVO should possibly be sent to some of our stakeholders, maybe our realtors, maybe the Prescott Chamber of Commerce. Look at your construction industry. We all have great thoughts and ideas on this document and everybody should have input and it should be considered. It might take a little bit longer, but then we're gonna come away with a document where we can all know that we contributed with heartfelt understanding. And I personally feel that that's what's missing right now, that heartfelt understanding. We have to work together to make this a rewarding document for the city, for our airport, which we know, and I'll say it again, is so doggone valuable. We need it, absolutely. So we need to remember Emory Riddle is important, the airport is important, and our stakeholders are important. And these stakeholders, they built the airport. They built our roads, they built our schools, and they built the homes that you live in. So for the betterment of our community, I ask that again, we put on some, not jamming force brakes, but some brakes to have further conversation where we can all um, come to Kumbaya and make this work. So thank you for your time this morning, Chair. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else wish to make a comment? My name is Luther Kraxberger. I live at 1328 Sierra Peaks. Um, I'm a resident of Prescott. I've moved here via Embry-Riddle. I graduated from Embry-Riddle. 
I know the value and importance of that university. Uh, I've lived here for 17 years. I just think, and would echo Sandy's comments that more time needs to be explored on this just from the standpoint that I'm in real estate now and a lot of the, from my perspective, a lot of the land around the airport that has a specific zoning um, it is drastically affected by this and it, it would potentially uh, limit the use in that area such that um, you know other areas around Prescott don't have the same zoning that's right around the airport. So it would just be important to get more comment on it, and that's all I have to say. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Anyone else? I do have a question. Um, based on some of the comments that are here right now and some of my own feelings, um, can you tell me the thinking behind the timeline? Why, why next month? Why as quickly as it's going forward? I mean, if there's some overriding reason why we need to do that, then we should be aware of it at least. So I actually wanted to talk just a moment about the timeline and clarification of that process. The requirement for holding a public hearing is both in land development code and in state law. Public hearings are the statutory time to obtain all the input from the public uh, on projects. So if there's an impetus to move this fast, it's to get it into the public hearing process. You can't vote for or against, so we're not ordaining a, a, an approval or disapproval. You're making a recommendation to council, right. so it's not one or the other. You can't vote on it until you've concluded public hearings on it. And I'm saying public hearings because you have the ability to have more than one public hearing on this. The ability to vote at your next meeting it doesn't mean you are required to vote at your next meeting. If you have a public hearing and you have enough public input that you want to suggest or recommend or advise city staff to make changes and bring you back something different, that is the purpose of a public hearing. So we're not rushing to a conclusion. If there's a rush, it's a rush to get into the public hearing process. So we get public comment on it. You're right that we haven't included the public very much at this stage. But until last week, we didn't have a draft to show the public. So this is an introduction to you so that you have the basic knowledge before we start the public process. And again, we're sending notices out to 2,500 people, 2,500 landowners within the airport area that could be affected by this and allowing them to start the public hearing process. Bring us your comments, your ideas, your questions. This is the time when we do that. The processes that are used for rezonings are pretty standard. If it's something that the public comes in and a property owner says, I want to rezone my property, this is exactly the same process we follow. We introduce it to you, and then we hold a public hearing or multiple public hearings to discuss that rezoning. So we're following the standard process. We are not rushing you to a conclusion or a recommendation. But until you hold a public hearing, you can't make a conclusion or a recommendation to council. George, I understand we're going to be sending out notifications to the property owners that could be affected this. Are there other entities that we should notify that may be affected? I'm thinking maybe Emmy Reto, uh, the Realtor Association. I don't know. We can certainly do that. Um, we are obligated to notify the property owners. Mm -hmm. Emory Riddle is a property owner affected by this, so I, they will get notification. All of the large manufacturing areas near the airport are obviously property owners and will get notification. Uh, we generally try to send those notices to the local address as well as to corporate addresses where there are corporate addresses. Um, as far as putting this out for public comment, um, we certainly have potential for help. We have the courier here. Uh, we also have the option of trying to post the, uh, the document and the maps on the city's website. Um, I, I've already started conversation about doing that, so we'll have that posted and the public will be able to review the document off of the website rather than uh, trying to obtain a hard copy of it. Um, obviously, we're trying to save some trees and not print hundreds of these. Um, 
They are going to be available as an electronic document, though. So we certainly aren't trying to either rush the process or obscure the process. If we were, we probably wouldn't be in front of you today. This is the beginning of the process. We're at the starting line today. Mr. Chairman, uh, if we do all this notification, we may want to move the next meeting to the uh, Findlay Toyota Center in Prescott <laughs> Valley. Um, I, this is a good example, I think, of communication. Uh, people come to some of these meetings, proposals, with agendas, and that's been obvious today. And I, I just want to commend you. I think we're going through the right process. Of, you know, you, you've had a task force. They put the, you all put together a draft. We did we did our first look at the draft today, and we have had some input. And uh, until we get that kind of buttoned up to get it out to the public, I think the process we're going through is just fine. Yeah, I've got a question for Mr. Polk. Actually, if you could come on up. So, Stephen, just under your agreement, on your current agreement, is there already a, I know you're talking about the agreement that's already in place. Anywhere along the process that was approved in 2017, where is there a plat already approved for the residents in this area and Deepwell? Uh, thank you, Mich Commissioner Goligoski. There are land use groups that are already approved. And what that says is you're, you're allowed to construct certain types of buildings within these areas. So those are maps. And it shows exactly where you can construct residential and where you can construct commercial. The individual plats come along as part of the master plan as we go along in the future. And so there are currently pending before uh, the city, there are multiple plats for subdivisions to be constructed. Okay, those haven't been been approved just yet is the plats, right? But the groups have, is what you're saying, great. And then also, um, you're looking for an overlay of exempt properties. Are you looking for an overlay? Are you looking for individual properties? What would you be looking for in particular from the city? Sure, I, I, my suggestion to the commission is a, a map showing, you know, which properties will be exempted from the AVO. You know, will that include all of Deep Ball Ranch master plan so that we can use our master plan and development agreement? Or are we stuck with these new restrictions under the AVO? Are you pushing the, the noise contours from 55 DNL all the way out to 65 DNL? And then I want to be really clear, you know, when this was adopted in 2017, that the noise was, was included in that and the runway protection zones and the airport impact zones were included in that. Yeah, so I remember that. expansion on, on right. where we were. Great. Okay, I just want to get more specifics out of you, and uh, you know, as we move forward in this process, and I'm sure you're speaking for many of the developments. I would imagine. <laughs> I'm just okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Appreciate you, Commissioner. And I'd say I'm, you know, I'm speaking on behalf of James Deepwell Ranch. I know there's there's the developers and others. They would love to to speak, and I'm I'm sure they'll all be at the next commission uh, at the next meeting to let you know. For sure. Thank you. Thanks. Tom. You know, it's a good point about, uh, I, I kind of like the idea of having a map that would indicate which properties are going to be uh, subject to the AVO and um, which have already pre-existing conditions. I mean, for us to make a recommendation to council uh, one way or another, that would have potentially onerous financial impacts on the city. Um, I think it's irresponsible of us to not consider some of these things as we start to move forward. I mean, I just, I just think it's irresponsible. Just as it would be irresponsible for the council not to take that into consideration when they make their decisions. They have to. It's their job. We can easily and will certainly provide you with mapping showing the existing developments in the area, the, the existing developments that are or will become non-conforming if the AVO is approved. Thank you. Yeah, Butch. Butch Tracy. Uh, first off, I, I agree with Tom completely. I'd love to see a map. Pretty simple stuff. Uh, I just have one comment. It was on Mr. James's inference that I've already made up my mind on this. And I, I got to tell you, nothing could be further from the truth. And I'm sure that's probably true with the rest of us. I can't speak for everybody. But for myself, that is not correct at all. We are looking at this very open-mindedly. We want to see all of it. 
So, thank you. Can I speak to that? Yes, it's not saying that. That is. Sir, come to the microphone, please. Ron James, I just want to correct that. That was not my inference that you guys had made up your mind. My inference was George's comment earlier that you guys will approve this. It was not my inference that you guys made up. My, my inference is that he has. Thank you. And my statement was that you would vote on this. <clears throat> I think it's clear. We're not there yet. No. Not even close. Why don't we go ahead and proceed with the rest of our agenda here? We yep. have some updates. Don, can I make a comment? Okay, Tom. Thank you. Um, I, I'd, I'd recommend that we find some wise people and give them the assignment to identify the stakeholders. That, that, that's all they got to do, identify the stakeholders because we don't know who they are yet. We can guess, <coughs> but without, without that piece of information, um, th th this could become very difficult. Um, we were kind of hoping you guys were the wise group that would help us do that. Our, at the base level, oh, property ownership certainly makes you a stakeholder, and, and that's the base level for notification. We assume that if you're a property owner being affected, you're a stakeholder. Other users who may be stakeholders are harder to identify, and we do appreciate help in identifying those other folks who are not property owners but are stakeholders. My guess is we'd be very surprised at what comes out of that effort. Do you have any potential thoughts on stakeholders that we are not going to notify? Well, they, we've mentioned some of them. I mean, Embry-Riddle, obviously. They're, they're property owner. Yeah, they, they, they have to be part of this. Technically, you know, uh, and all, uh, The State Chamber of Commerce, that was mentioned. Mm -hmm. Clearly, they need to be involved. Uh, and on and on and on and on. Uh, but we, but we all have our own mental models, and, and until you surface those and collect them, we really don't know what, what's out there. And I, and I think we'll really be surprised at what we miss if we don't do that. May I speak as a staff member and someone who will be helping to send out all those mailings? You make um, me nervous. What, don't, don't be nervous. I was wondering, you know, I'm thinking, thinking out loud of, you know, we're, we're identifying realtors, contractors, chamber of commerce. Where will we get said list of realty office and contractors so as to be totally inclusive? I, I think we can certainly provide those lists. Sorry about the conversation between staff, but that's a very legitimate okay. question. We have a pretty good knowledge of groups in town that we identify with real estate and development. I think the concern I have, I know the concern I have, is Commissioner Hutchinson pointing out that people who aren't directly related to building, construction, flying airplanes, could still be stakeholders. And some of that will be difficult to identify. And in some cases, the more public we make the process, posting on the website, articles in newspapers, press releases, maybe the only way we get to stakeholders that we can't identify at this point. So some of this is going to be maybe a shotgun blast of information out and hope we get all of the stakeholders. If we know of particular groups, we certainly will include those groups. The realtors associations, there are several in town, and we know them all. I go and talk to them periodically. So we can certainly address them. We obviously know YCCA, uh, the Contractors Association, uh, is a pretty big one. They represent not just builders and contractors, they represent developers. Um, the airport certainly has stakeholder groups that meet on the airport. We have a list of those folks. We know who they are. So we have some. Whether it's a comprehensive list is kind of hard to tell. As you say, we may not know who all of them are. I don't think we can be perfect, but it sounds like we're making a good faith effort to do so. And, and we do need to be careful that we don't let perfection stop us from moving forward something that may be good. And again, as far <laughs> hasn't ever done that in the past. 
<laughs> as far as the actions by this body, your your purpose is to vet this proposal and make recommendations to the city council. Those recommendations could be to approve it, to modify it, to not approve it. Um, there and there are stages in between all of those. Not approve part of it, approve all of it. I mean, you know, you, you have pretty broad discretion to come back with recommendations. You also don't have a direct timeline. This is not an outside application which has statutory timelines associated with it. If someone brings me a rezoning request from outside, we have a certain period of time by state law that we have to take action. Even if it's a denial, we have to take action. This is generated by the city. It's generated by the, the government entity, and that means you have the, the amount of time you feel you need. As far as notifications are concerned, I, I, the more people, the, the better get notified. Is do you? We as, would as, we as, would attempt to notify via skywriting, but Robin won't let. I us. understand that. <laughs> <laughs> Violate the airspace. Um, do you notify uh, people who are renting, like commercial? You notify the building owners, but what about the people who are actually occupying the buildings? It's often difficult to do that. Again, if we can get addresses of local addresses for businesses, we will notice the local address. Okay. We, we automatically notice the property owner. So if we can identify a local address of a, of a, a rental, we will do that as well. Okay. Well, maybe something in the paper might help getting people <laughs> to pay attention. There's no such thing as bad press. Any other comments? Yeah, let's not boil the ocean. And okay. We're going to move on. Updates, staff announcements? I don't really have any staff announcements for you today. Okay. Um, we thought this would be some, enough for you to keep you busy. You want to talk about the general plan update? Um, we are scheduling a meeting of the... Tammy, are you there? You want to talk to us through the speaker? Uh, yeah, we have our first meeting coming up on the 24th of August. It will be our kickoff meeting um, to kind of go over the process and kind of what we're going to create a schedule and just go over some open meeting laws and what is a general plan and what's required. So that will be on the 24th. Thank you. Okay. Do you have any other questions about that? All of our meetings for the uh, general plan process are open to the public. So anyone interested in the general plan committee meetings and the, the goings on of those meetings are welcome to attend. Uh, there will also be a Zoom option to attend those meetings. Mr. Chair, I know Mr. Gamboji at the last meeting wanted to talk about an item that was discussed at the council. So we agendized uh, that if there's something he wants to address at this point. He can. Um, no, I've I covered that with the okay. important parties. So we've added that as a general <coughs> line item <laughs> to your agenda. So if there's any action that the council took based on your prior recommendations, if you want to talk about that, you can. Uh, are you, are you going to? We did we did talk at the last meeting about having a commissioner present at council meetings yes. where there are agenda items from the commission. And that didn't happen last time. What, what we've discussed since that occurred was that we will notice uh, the chair and vice chair of items moving forward. Now, we're going to notice every commission member so they can say they want they to want or, attend don't, or want. don't want to attend. The chair or the vice chair will attend. automatically attend. So all of you would be invited to attend. But the chair and vice chair will choose if they're going to be there, and you may or may not want to come too. And that's to provide both an opportunity for you to speak about why actions were taken, but also an opportunity for counsel to ask you questions about the action you took. Any question from the commission members of what we're doing, why and we're George, doing George, let's this talk time? about that a little bit in reference to the open meeting law and how we agendize it on a council. And of course, if you may, if you do that, you may have a majority of the, the we, planning and zoning commissioners we, attending. We just need to make sure that it's we would agendized the appropriately. Clerk's office. Yes. Okay. Okay. Anything else, George? I'm good, sir. We are adjourned.